Coming to you from the TLD studios in Temecula, California, it's the Whiskey Throttle Show, taking you deep inside the lives of the legends and leaders of our sport. This week's guest is brought to you by Yamaha, the leaders in the power sports industry. Motocross bikes, street bikes, adventure bikes, side-by-sides, quads, boats, generators. Yamaha sets the standard. Yamaha revs your heart. Method Race Wheels, the strongest, lightest, fastest wheels in off-road. Method dominates the off-road market with wheels for your truck, sprinter, Jeep, or UTV. Go to methodracewheels.com forward slash whiskey throttle for 20% off your order. Troy Lee Designs. Built for the world's fastest racers, TLD blends elite level protection with industry leading style and performance. Moto, bike, helmet paint, casual wear, whatever your passion, Troy Lee Designs is waiting for you on the next level. Nihilo Concepts enhance your riding experience with superior products like the Start Stop Conversion Kit, Fuel Pet Cocks, Frame Grip Tape, Lever Grip, Grip Donuts, Secondary On Switch, Billet Foot Pegs billet throttle housings, and so much more. The Hilo Concepts produces exceptional products, all of which are made right here in America. And by SKDA. SKDA is the ultimate destination for exceptional motocross graphics, customer service, and artistic excellence. Trust them to elevate your ride and showcase your individuality on the track, making every ride an exceptional experience. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here at the Whiskey Throttle Show. I'm your host, David Pingree, and today's show is uh, special. It's uh, definitely something I've been looking forward to. Phil, we've tried to have you on for a couple different times. First time you got COVID, I think. I did. I was supposed to do it with my brother, and uh, the day before I got COVID, I couldn't really uh, come yeah, spread it with you Probably guys. not. Probably not a good idea. We've tried a few times. It didn't work out. Anyway, <laughs> stoked to finally have you on, and you're not only a buddy of mine from way back, but my brother-in-law. And so um, yep. a lot of people maybe don't know that. And uh, we, we get started in all of our shows with the Method Race Wheels front end chatter. They bring the, the, the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels for your truck, van, sprinter, off-road vehicle. 20% off using the code Whiskey Throttle. So just go to www.methodracewheels.com forward slash Whiskey Throttle. They'll send you a code for 20%. So I guess let's start with this is how are we related? So people know. So uh, we married sisters. Um, yeah, you. So I remember, remember the story. The, I I totally remember the story. You want me to back up and tell the whole story? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the whole story. Yeah. I was I okay. was I was having a house built, so I was living with Casey Johnson, and my wife's sister April in was living Tuscany with us. Hills, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, she was just back from nursing school, so kind of getting situated out here. So she was living with us. This is my wife he's talking yeah. about. My wife's yeah. sister, April, older yeah. sister. And uh, we were staying with Casey Johnson and you and Palmer came up to hang yeah. out. Yeah, so how it how it worked, right, is like you were married, you married this girl named Amber. And uh, what did you guys think of Amber when you met her too? Did um, you... Sh- well, <laughs> I, I thought that lucky sucker. <laughs> That's what I thought, really. But did you? And, and she was like super sweet. And well, I wouldn't call Amber sweet. She's like she's awesome. Amber's awesome. And um, I didn't really even know she had a sister, right? I mean, I had no idea. Yeah. But but then I found out, and I I remember asking you about April one time way back in the day before I even knew who she was. And you're like, no, dude, no, no, no. Oh, you, really? Yeah. You oh, didn't, I don't remember that. Yeah. You didn't want anything to do with it. And, um, well, yeah, that day I was going to come up to dinner or, or, yeah. And you were like, she's a good girl, Phil. Don't, don't <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it, uh, if it, but... Ping used to live with me. Right. Yeah, we'll when get, you, we'll get yeah, to all yeah, that. We're yeah, gonna go through so, all that story. So yeah, we we had a lot of background before you even knew Amber. Yeah. Yeah, we lived yeah. together. Well, I just mm. remember you coming to the house and I going, "Hey, are you is it cool if I ask April out?" And I was at that point, the way I remember it, I was like, "Yeah, dude. I mean, she's an adult. I'm not. Whatever you want, whatever she wants." That was after we had dinner. I was like, "Yeah, I think." Did we go to dinner? Or we had dinner at the house. No, we had dinner yeah. at Casey Johnson's yeah. house, right? Yeah. And it was me and Palmer. Yeah. Sean Palmer came up and no, I, I don't think I drove with him because I had to go to work that night. That's oh, when I was okay. working. So I left early 
in Palmer stayed. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I, early on, and Amber and I were both concerned because Amber knew your <laughs> reputation early on because you'd go what into Chili's. What reputation Chili's, is that? <laughs> being no, a bit okay, of a ladies okay, man, yeah, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> we were just like looking out for April like, hey, you know, don't this, yeah. don't just like mess around with this girl. Well, dude, you know? this is your sister, right? Sister-in-law, so of course. And nowadays, I'm like, gosh, <laughs> Phil, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm... It, <laughs> I think I was worried early on just making sure you were serious about, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, But now I'm stoked. Yeah. I got a cool brother-in-law. Yep. Um, how close yeah. do you follow the sport? Because that's one thing we're going to get into and um, talk a little bit about how much you don't ride anymore these days. But how close do you follow it? Um, I think that uh, I watch the highlights. <laughs> on YouTube of all the races. I kind of follow it. Like every time I talk to you, I'm like asking you questions, yeah, right? Yeah. So I don't follow it extent, like extensive. Um, but you still kind of, up kind of I'm up to date and I know a little bit. Uh, it's not a religion to me anymore. Yeah. You know, but I kind of follow it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of excellent writing. You know, these guys that are going so fast today, I'm just like, man super impressive yeah because i know right i know what it takes to be able to do that yeah and you'll ask me hey what about this guy so i know you you at least right. see clips and yeah stuff and yeah so i kind of just stuff. thumb through stuff and i'll watch the highlights sometimes i actually went to anaheim this year a2 oh did you yeah what do you think of the show yeah. like i i, I thought it was great to, i like i know you've, time. you've seen it over the years but think back to like the early 90s when you first raced one or went to one and it was like hay bales and there's no there's not a lot of show to it so actually we were i was in a suite with jeff emig and i said hey man that guy just landed on the hay bale and emma goes they're not hay bales anymore <laughs> they're tough blocks i still call them <laughs> so, that. so i'm like yeah i'm old yeah <laughs> it's changed a lot though huh? it's, yeah yeah it, it's impressive it's, it's a good cool. show yeah you could take somebody show. who's never been doesn't know a thing about dirt bikes yep. and go you'll have a good time yeah, it was cool. And nine times out of ten, they're gonna be like, "That was rad." Yeah, you know, like way more exciting than a baseball game. Or, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Even if they know nothing about yep. it. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. Um, well, hey, uh, listen, that was our front uh, method race was front end chatter. Uh, go to whiskeythrottlemedia.com if you guys haven't had a peek over there. We started a whole company basically creating content for you guys, and uh, our focus is more the people, the culture. And the community of racing, it's not so much uh, covering races and stuff like that or the technical stuff. We do have bike tests and bike builds and, and all that kind of stuff. But lots of cool content over there that I think you'll enjoy. We also have merch. We have a forum. Uh, you can get all kinds of stuff over there. So check that out. And then also go to ElevateActionSports.com. If you are in the market to improve your riding, become a safer rider, a better rider technically. Uh, myself, Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emig, Grant Lakeston, Johnny Campbell, and a whole host of mechanics, including Bones from Pro Circuit, Jay Clark, uh, doing suspension and doing bike maintenance channels. We've got a fitness channel with Coach Rob Beams and a sports psychology channel with Lorraine Huber. Um, a complete one-stop shop to help you become a better and safer rider. ElevateActionSports.com. Uh, become a member. It's 25 bucks a month, and uh, you get access to some pretty cool stuff, including a ride day at Cheney Ranch, which is very exclusive next month only to our members. And uh, we do a monthly Zoom call as well to answer any questions you might have. So check that out. Let's get to our guest story brought to you by Yamaha today. Where'd you grow up? Was it Cherry Valley or Yucca Valley? I grew up younger, Yucca Valley. Yucca Valley. Yep, out in the desert. That's what uh, I thought. Yeah, I just came home and rode in the desert all, like every day. That's quite it, a spot for people who don't know Yucca Valley. It's like yeah, out in the middle of nowhere. It's out in the desert. You're in the desert for sure. <laughs> cactus a, a lot of cactus it was it was pretty cool i i liked it as a kid growing you up probably just you guys could just take off and it was like living in the country it was yep. well it was the desert yeah like legit desert it, i mean it's like 120 up. degree desert uh, in the no summer. because it was high desert uh, okay. lower desert was like palm springs palm desert and it gets you know that hot it does get hot yeah <laughs> like that but um very rarely a high desert doesn't get as hot and you had two brothers and a sister, right? Uh, Randy Lawrence, who we've had on the show, is Jeremy's mechanic and my mechanic and Yogi's mechanic. Um, now does training and coaching. Uh, Rob, your old, oldest brother, right? Yep. It was Rob, Randy, then you, and then Shelly, your youngest sister. Yep. Um, 
What was it like out there as kids? Like, yeah. So my oldest brother, uh, Rob, uh, he, man, he was so good on a dirt bike and he would come home. He was probably 16, 17 years old and he was training. He wanted to be a pro and mm -hmm. he was really good. He was so, he was big, strong, and that guy could ride. I saw his results at Loretta's. It's under Larry Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, Larry Lawrence. Larry Robert Lawrence yeah. is his name. We call him Rob. Um, so I just remember going with him to the track and watching him and pound out motos, and he was a strong guy, mm. for sure. Um, was he fast enough to make it? Like, was he on the right track? I think that he was, yes. I think that he was good enough to make it. Mm. Yep, to the pro level. Absolutely. He was strong. He, I, th I think he had everything it took. The only problem is I think he, well, for sure, I don't think, I know. He burnt himself out and got into stuff that he shouldn't have got into and uh, had mm -hmm. some bad influences around him and went that's downhill. That's big, right? Bad influences. Oh, that's everything. So, and, and yeah, I want to talk to you about that a little bit later on in the show is who you hang out with is, is very important. You know, there's a guy, and I can't remember his name. He's like a, I think he does motivational speaking and talks a lot about finances, but he says, you want to see your future, show me your friends. The people you surround yourself with, that's exactly who you will become. And it's scary how true that is. And for me, like watching my kids, I'm always looking at their friends going, I don't like that person. Like we've got to get our kids away from them, you know? So I think that's true more so that people are not, solid in themselves you know somebody that's like super confident and like has a good foundation behind them i i feel like they're the leaders they can hang out with it yeah whoever they want like so i'll give you an example like jeremy i grew up with jeremy right being his friend and man that guy knew who he was yeah and he knew what he was gonna do and he didn't let anybody really influence him from what i know you know he was himself and he's still that same guy. And he's yeah. still that same guy, which is incredible. And one of the things that I think helped instill this in Jeremy is his dad and mom. They still, you know, I just remember being around and them talking to Jeremy and like giving him so much wisdom about life. And he had a great foundation. Mm. Incredible. He was confident yeah. in who he was. Yeah, that's that's interesting. He, he's still mm. maybe the most headstrong guy I've ever seen. I, yeah, I don't know anybody. Yeah. Um, tell me, I, I, this is actually something I don't really know the answer to. I know your mom passed away when you were younger. 13, yep. And she had cancer? She had cancer, yeah. So you were 13. Randy would have been like 17, 18? 17, yeah. Okay. 17. Yep. Um, how hard was that on you guys? And your, were they your parents <clears throat> together still at that point? Um, no, they had got oh, a divorce. My dad had married somebody else. We lived in Yucca Valley. My mom lived in Beaumont. So the second, from about... 15 or 16, I moved to Beaumont, Cherry Valley. And that's where probably you okay. remember. That's where I see the Cherry Valley. <clears throat> yeah. So it was tough. It was real tough. But <clears throat> I think kids have a way of uh, coping, you know, with tragedy or stuff that's like extremely hard on them. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a weird, it was a weird, extremely difficult thing because, you know, when your mom passes away, it's like being a young young boy and then i had a i had my younger sister shelly right i think about her and like so much tragedy and how she felt and our stepmom was definitely not not great. the nicest person mm. she was pretty mean sometimes she didn't beat us or anything like that but it, it was tough not compassionate not a, <clears throat> not a good mom yeah 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 she had stuff going on and i, th I think like that too else. at different ages um you process it differently. My folks divorced when I was 10 and my sister was 13, 14. So she handled it a lot differently than I did. Felt like I could kind of, it didn't affect me as much because I didn't kind of know what was going on. I didn't understand it. And how old were you? Did you 10. say? Yeah. Um, so I say that it didn't really affect me a whole bunch. I say that same thing, but maybe it did. Maybe yeah, it affected yeah. us more than it actually, well, than we think. For right? sure it does. Mm -hmm. I mean, your parents aren't together anymore. I mean, of course, right, it's a hugely right. traumatic thing yeah, for any family, yeah. right? I mean, yep. you your odds of your kids being successful go up exponentially just by you and your wife staying together. Yeah, um, that's statistics. Numbers right? back. Yeah, up. I mean so, that's a proven proven statistic. So I think we came out of it all right, broken homes, <laughs> but 
but who knows? Maybe we would have been much cooler and much more successful. Uh, or, or, or maybe our foundation would have been more stable. We would have been more confident. Yeah. Yeah. As racers, just across the board, you're like just more Jeremy. confident. Mm. Like Jeremy. And then who knows, right? Mm. <clears throat> That's one thing in my racing career and my, like, my confidence and my mental strength was so low. Mm. I just did not have that at all. And it could have been a multiple reasons why. Maybe just naturally I'm not. Maybe just circumstantial. I, I don't know what it is. I would say the same thing. From That would have been one of my... yeah biggest roadblocks injury was another one which i think affected you pretty heavy too yeah. but for sure like these guys like jeremy or ricky or reed even if they weren't winning they'd go to the races every weekend thinking i'm winning and you, i don't know that i ever did that right ever. and you and you talk to those guys like you know them personally right and so do i i mean some of them are my friends just the way they talk and the things they say you know that this guy's solid yeah He's not like wishy-washy. Like, I think back, I was a kook. You know, some, <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, right? I mean, I know it all looked cool on the outside, but I know inside what I was thinking. Yeah. And the stuff I did, why I did it. It was like for everybody else, not for, like, right. because I wanted to do it. And I would say now, you and I both, now we're confident in who we are, right? I think you, mm. which we'll talk about, you've built a, an amazing yeah. company. <clears throat> You got a family, like you're solid. I don't. I think if someone met you now, they'd be like, he's he's like tight. Phil's well, got it locked in. Yeah, I appreciate that, but it's you know a lot of work and a lot of like trial and error and just yeah, your your focus changes, right? Yeah. So it's like, but as you figured out who you are, you become more confident. I think you and I yeah. both were dealing with for different reasons the same thing at, during our careers, trying to figure out who we were, right, and be confident yep. in that. Yeah. So when, when your background is so scattered, yeah. it's like, what foundation do you have? Right, right? I mean, so let me ask you a question. What elite, elite, top level, I'm talking guys who win championships a lot. Which guys have broken families and chaos in, in their life when they're growing up? Which ones? Wow. I never thought of this. Well, Jeremy's what? parents are together still. Ricky's parents are together still. James' parents are still together still. I don't know Reed's. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know Reed easy. Dungy's parents are together still. <gasps> Dude. Yeah, wow. I, mean, I mean, I don't know. This is the first I've ever thought of that. But as you and I are talking, I'm thinking, dude, it's like, it's a big deal. Maybe it affects people more than we think. Statistics show. Of course. Right? Yeah. I mean, they show. I've never thought of that, dude. Yeah, Maybe that either. equates to more self-esteem, more confidence. Yep. And in sports, That's what, what is 80% of the battle? It's everything. Confident and know you can do it. I mean, you and I both know mm. on our best day when our heads were right, we could, we yeah. were, we could win. Yeah. But we yep. couldn't do it consistently. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's all because of upstairs. Absolutely. It wasn't yeah. anything else. That's, man, you just blew my mind. <laughs> I'm Cheers. Gonna, I'm going to look into that, dude. Like, that's really something. I can't think of a of a legendary champion guy right now who's Tomac. parents are Tomac's parents Cooper are together. Webb. I don't know his parents, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know either. Crazy. Crazy, crazy. You should do that. I'm going to. You should, like, do, like, a, a story on that and just see. Man. Okay, I got to get us back on track. You just okay, blew my mind. Sorry. Um, okay, what did you do as a kid? Did you guys play any other sports before you got into dirt bikes? Did I, you guys... I didn't. I Nothing didn't else. at all. I, I loved dirt bikes. I wanted to ride dirt bikes. I never thought that I would actually do something in dirt bikes. I just loved riding. And you guys so BMXed like, a lot, right? We BMXed a lot. Yeah. We rode a lot of bikes. So, Which was honestly, basically... It was my older brother, okay. Rob, yep. and my dad... And Rand, Randy, he, you know, we would go to De Anza Cycle Park and they would race. And at the beginning, I would go and flag all day. Oh, they really? They would pay me $20 and go flag. So as soon as we got there, I'd run up. I want to flag today. So I would be one of the little kids on the side of the track flagging all day for 20 bucks. When it was over, come back. Okay, 20, I saw your guys' race. 20 bucks is pretty good yeah, back then. Yeah, it was then, really too. good. Yeah, so that's what I did. I, I was just a big fan. I didn't... I tried... Maybe flag football one time or... Okay. You didn't do any other team sports? None. None at all. I wanted to ride. I would come home, get on my dirt bike and go. 
That's cool. And you guys could ride. So, and you, yeah, you rode out of our, your garage. You're yeah. in the desert. You rode. So were you kind of getting hand-me-down bikes from your older brothers then? No, or? they were, they were too big. My oh. dad got me bikes. Okay. Like, I think my first bike I was a Z50, a Honda, right? That was when I was really little, but then I got an MR50 Suzuki. I don't know even when that was. And then after that, it was like a 1984 YZ80. Wasn't that your first new <clears throat> new bike, I think? My first new bike. Yeah. So how that worked was I lived in the desert. My friends rode three-wheelers, ATCs, right? <laughs> so, you know, I would get Ds and Fs in school because I didn't care about school. I hated it. Mm. So, and I just didn't try at all in school. And my dad said... Um, if you get no D's or F's, you can get A's, B's, and C's on your next report card. Because my report card was bad. It was D's and F's. Then I'll get you an ATC. And that's what I wanted, a 200X <laughs> <laughs> to go riding. And I did right away. I said, okay. And then I tried in school. And then on the way down to Beaumont Yamaha, like we were driving down to pick up an ATC, I changed my mind. I said, no, Dad, I want a YZ80 instead. Just like that. I, I, I want a YZ80 instead. Okay. So, th yeah, my first real, yeah. you know. And then I started racing at De Anza Cycle Park, 80 beginner. YZ80, 1984. Did you fall in love with it right away or were you just oh, kind of... Oh, yeah. I was stoked. Yeah. Okay. I was so pumped. I remember my first race, I won. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. And then on the way home, I'm like, who cares? That was 80 beginner. And then the next weekend, I raced novice. And then won that because I would ride out in the hills. Just, I mean, you out, could ride. I, I yeah. rode. Yeah, yeah, I could ride. I mean, I and I rode a lot every day, more than probably everybody anybody else. In so did you move? Up. So the next weekend you rode novice. Yeah, and I stayed novice for a month or two, or you know, three or four races, and then I went to intermediate, and then that's when those kids were starting to get yeah. fast. And um, who who were you? Like you said, your friends were all riding ATCs. Which ones were riding motorcycles? Like, who were you kind of riding and racing? Because um, one thing about uh, your era, and you were just a, a little bit older than me, but I was in the tail end of this too, is, man, there was a big group of guys out here. You know? Out here? Oh, who did I ride with when I was like in the desert? Well, when I was growing start up? there. Did any of those okay. guys continue racing or no? Um, so Lance Cody was a great friend of mine. He rode uh, Rick Neff. Rick Neff lives in the desert. I still talk to that guy all the time. Uh, I think you probably know him. I think I've met him, yep. Yep. Uh, Rick Neff and uh, Larry Pacheco. Miho. He has Mijo. his kid racing now, yep. And we would just go ride out in the desert. Courtney Gannett. He had a CR80, 1984. I remember Courtney. <laughs> I've met him, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> I think he's running Paris Raceway or something like that. I don't know. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it would just be a group of kids, and then my family would go ride, and I mean, well, that's just what we did: is yeah. ride dirt bikes. So when did it, when did it start getting more serious for you then? Because because we had the cool thing living in Southern California at the time. This is why it was such such an advantage: the Golden State Series, the TransCal, yep. uh, GFI. Like there was, you didn't have to leave the state. Yep. There was no, amateur no, nationals here all yeah, the time. Yeah, California was it. You know, I. I think, right? Back then, yes. Back then. There was really not another way to get there. It was very hard. <laughs> so we need to get serious. Like 84, 85. I think in 1986, Yamaha gave me some 80s. Mm. I mean, I, I was probably six foot tall in the 80 expert class. I got to the 80 expert class. It was awful. You know, I was this huge kid on an on a 80, and I think 86, yeah. Yamaha gave me a couple bikes because I would go to all the races, all the amateur nationals. And I would get smoked. Like Gaddis, Button. You were going like to Loretta's and stuff even back then? Um, I wouldn't go to Loretta's. I think I did the like Golden States. But Golden States were huge back then, right? Yeah. They were huge. Every Jeff Emig came out from Kansas. Oh, they Young were, kid, right? Yeah, all the top. Wardy, yeah. RJ, Dogger. Those guys were yeah, all coming the, to Yeah, the Golden State, it was the, everybody. You know, that that was actually people raced other than the AMA Nationals. Well, I had pulled up your uh, Loretta's results. I don't know if I can find them here, but... From amateur? From, from yeah, from your racing amateur. And um, you never won a title back there, but you got second, right? I got second, yep. Yeah, and, mm. and your results, I think you went three different years. And your results every year got better, 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 until you were second that last one. Yeah, so I got second at Loretta's, and then... I think it was that year, 
that I won the World Mini, three out of four pro classes at the World Mini. Um, Ezra Lusk won the other class. And the mm-hmm. only reason he won it is I had it won. The last corner before the finish, they watered. And I, I was just going slow around the last corner. And I was going to win four out of four championships in the pro class. My, they just watered it. I slid out. Is this, goes, is this the old world mini track like in Henderson? No, it was the newer oh, one. Oh, the newer one. Out okay. by the raceway. Yeah. Yeah. That place sucked. Button was there. I remember JB. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm saying. Who are the guys then that you started, you raced kind of competitive amateur and into pro with? Oh, my gosh. Because there was the Albrechts. So, yeah. Jeremy and Joel Albrecht. So, like, the fast, fast guys were Jeff Emig, Ryan Hughes, Jeremy McGrath. Uh, Pedersen. Chad Pedersen was Swink. incredible. Chad Pedersen was like, yeah. he could beat all of us. He really could. That, that kid was... Bradshaw was a little bit before us, but, like, him and Pedersen, Pratt, Chad Pedersen and Damon Bradshaw, we, uh, we thought those are Yamaha's guys, that they're grooming to be the yeah. baddest ever. Yeah, it's. I don't think people, unless you were around back then, you don't know how fast Swap was. The original Swap. Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, a madman. He, he was. He was one of the baddest dudes yeah. there were for sure. So just having that many good guys in your group, man, you, you couldn't we help but each other. Yeah, just pushed. It, so the thing in Southern California, we would go to local Paris race or Brona Oaks or wherever, and on the line it was Jeremy, Ryan Hughes, me. Button would come out from Arizona. It's like you had four or five guys that were the best in yeah. the country. Yeah. And we had that locally every weekend. So it was hard to beat our group. Swing, Swingster did. That yeah. dude was bad. I know. It's impressive when you have a guy like Ezra or Swingster yeah. or one of these guys that comes out of some random state where he didn't have anybody to push him. Right. He would show up a few times a year yeah. to those big events. That's the only time he got to have yeah. any competition. Yeah. Where you guys every weekend you go to Paris right. and it's like, okay, I better be on because I got three national caliber yeah, guys. That's great. It's just special kids, right? Yeah. There's once in a while you get a special kid that's like, James Stewart, are you kidding me? Look what he <laughs> yeah. did on a dirt bike. I know. It's like Yeah. Was there a year yeah. that you that you kind of would call like your breakout year? Where you you like maybe that year at uh, world mini when you were winning so well what i would say is like when i was 80 expert i would just get smoked every week i was way too big for the bike yeah. and the yamahas back then probably weren't the best 80 either as soon as i got rid of that and jumped up onto a, a bigger bike like a 125 and 250 that that was a eye-opener for me it's like 80, all 87 sudden, was that 87 yep, yeah yeah because i remember my first big bike race i borrowed my older brother rob I borrowed his 250. He had a Honda 250, and I went and raced at De Anza. No more ADX, but I said, oh, I'm going to race a big bike this weekend. And that was that was it. I was just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like, I killed everybody. And I was, you know, it felt so good, and it fit me. It was a good bike. And I'm just like, oh, I'm done with 80s. Mm. Yeah. So getting up to the big bikes was kind of your jump. Yeah, that was my jump. And what was Yamaha doing for you? Just just some bikes and parts? Just bikes and parts, yep. Yeah. Yep. No and, technical stuff? Was Mitch um, helping you with motors and suspension? Uh, Peyton, yep. Pro Circuit definitely helped me out. They helped me out a lot. I know you, you worked yep. with him from way back. Mitch, yeah. he That guy has helped me so much yeah. through my career. Yeah. He's awesome. And, and then the first opportunity I had to ride for him, I turned him down. I know. I, I saw Horrible that. Horrible uh, decision. Horrible decision. That's the, what I want to talk to you about, like, we'll get who there. you hang I, out with, right? It's coming. I'm, I'm going to ask you about it because yeah. you you did have a, a... You made a decision that could have definitely changed the path of your career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I get there, though, was Randy wrenching for you as you were in these phases? Or were you guys um, kind of working on your own when, stuff? Well, I think right when I went pro. Okay. Yep. And was he was like still 89? racing prior to that? No, he wasn't. Okay. So I think in, like... 87, maybe, Rand decided, my brother Randy decided, uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ride bikes, bicycles. Mm-hmm. I want to do freestyle, uh, mountain bikes, dirt jump. That's what I want to do. I don't want to race anymore. It ran, ran. He was great. He was He's on the cover of yeah. Freestyler magazine. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, he, he did great. He's talented on two wheels. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. So um, did you win any amateur? You won, obviously, world mini titles. Did you ever win, like, Mammoth? Or did you ever go to Winter Olympics or Ponca? I went to Ponca? Winter Olympics. I, I never won. I don't think I won Mammoth. I almost won Mammoth, my very first pro event. RJ was there. But I was young. Yeah. And dumb and tired. <laughs> <laughs> and mostly tired. Mo mostly tired. <laughs> so I shouldn't say almost. There was a whole bunch. <laughs> uh, That's funny. All right. So your first, you turned pro in 89. Yep. Right? And it says your first pro race was at Hangtown that year. You got 22nd riding a 250. Yep. Um, just did you ride the two fifty just because you were taller? Like what? I, what made you jump right into that class? I have no idea. Oh, don't remember. No guidance. Just oh, I'm gonna ride a two fifty. <laughs> you got twenty second. I mean, not yeah, terrible. Yeah. What do you, do you remember that at all? Like what? Uh, you're riding a Honda, right? Is that what you said? No, 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 no. Oh, uh, that was my first big bike. Oh, race, gotcha. Honda your brother's bike. Answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't remember. You don't remember anything about it? Not really. Uh -uh. Oh, wow. I don't remember why I did that. That was my first national at Hangtown? Yeah. Well, that's the first one on the AMA books. Yeah, well. Unless there was something weird. And then yeah. you did Millville on a 125 later that summer and got 19th. So oh, earned a okay. Point. I improved. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we went into 90. Um, do you remember going into that season? So I think in 1990... <clears throat> um, I don't think I was doing any supercrosses or nationals. And actually I one of my heroes was Damon Bradshaw, right? I used to just whenever Damon was around, I would just be like, Oh, Bradshaw. Dude, the kid was so bad. Yeah. And, and I had the opportunity to go stay at his house. And I think it was in nineteen ninety. His dad, Randy, um, totally hooked me up, gave me a bike, was my mechanic, took me to like three national or two supercrosses and a national. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I was just went, flew out to his house, stayed at his house with him. And his parents totally dialed me in, took me around. I don't even know if I paid him. What a jerk. I look <laughs> back now. It's like, dude, they, they did so much yeah. for me. And I was just a punk kid that I'm not really huh. sure. But that was an incredible experience to be able to do that. His dad's a fireman. Did you know that? Yeah, I yeah. did know that. Yep. Mustache like yours. Yeah. Um, so 90, were you riding Yamaha still? Support? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you actually had started, you, you and I talked about this before the show, like you were kind of looking through your results going, oh, I did pretty good. Yeah, like, yeah. For really impressed. your first Supercross, you, you were eighth at your very first one. At my first Supercross? What, what Anaheim was 1990 on a 125. Dude, eighth? Yeah, I'll take that all day. Totally. Who got eighth this weekend, right? In Oakland. Probably somebody good. I'd have to look. <laughs> probably somebody pretty good. Houston, the next round was in East West. You were 16th, so you know, that okay. makes sense. Then San Diego, you went sixth, fifth at Seattle, ninth at Vegas, sixth at Pasadena, and then a couple of rough ones. But man, that's pretty good. A couple, a couple of rough ones. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, so the thing back well, then. Now, hold on. Like, and this was the other thing I want to ask you because I, I <laughs> tripped out when I was looking at this too. So you raced 125 Supercross. You raced a 250 National at Lake Sugar Tree. So that's when I was with Bradshaw. That's oh, okay. when I went and stayed with him. You got ninth on a 250. Dude, I couldn't believe it. I was stoked. <laughs> <laughs> then, oh, so check this out. I got a story about that. Okay. So, like, I was so pumped. I think I went 8 8 for ninth or something like that. Like, I mean, it was an incredible day. Were his point. parents pumped? Like, they had to be, like, stoked uh, Yeah, for heck yeah. They were totally and stoked. And Damon, he would have been in he, the one... I think Damon place? won. Okay. Because he let Wardy by, waved him by, Mr. Like, come on, I'm way better than you. Oh, Wardy ended up beating him the first moto because he... Bradshaw was winning, and he had this track dialed. He would live there. He would just kill everybody. He waved Wardy by, just like to be a punk. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is what I remember. Anyway, and Wardy ended up beating him that moto. And I remember coming in and Randy, his dad. Pissed. So mad. Like, he was just angry. And uh, Damon went out and just killed him the next moto. Like, like Jeez. beat him bad. Wardy's not a guy you want to mess with. No, but check this out. So, you know, we go home, race is over. I got eighth, dude. I, or ninth. I was super pumped. Yeah. So Yamaha 
had rented Sugar Tree Track the next week. So me and Damon drove up and I'm with him and and I'm riding with him. And it, it was like I was a beginner because Damon was actually riding with me, like just playing around with me and stuff. And just some of the lines that he had and how he was riding, I remember just thinking, dude, I wish you would have showed me this stuff before, you know, before the race. And it was just, it was a big difference. I opened what, it. Yeah. Because yeah. I was pumped. I got top 10 at a national. Well, dude, it's a big difference between this guy and you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he was at the top of his game at that he, point, right? Yeah, so yeah, he was. He was. That's bad. comparing yourself to yeah. Superman a little bit. Yeah. Well, okay. So so two, you do 250 motocross. The next weekend, <laughs> you go to East Rutherford and do 250 supercross. That with okay. Bradshaw, right? The so Randy. Sixteenth, you made the main. Got a sixteenth. Yeah. I mean, thousand bucks made the main. And then you're back to 250 motocross, mm-hmm. 125 supercross. Then you go ahead and go to Washougal and ride a 500. You rode every class this year. You rode every single bike. How did I do with the, You no. got a 12th at Washougal on the 500. You went to Millville, got 22nd on the 500. And then your last one was an 8th at Broom in the 500 class. That's crazy. You're killing it. Yeah. But you rode every single so class. So that actually wasn't a 500. It was Yamaha 360. Ah, okay. Because where Yamaha had that 490 yeah. that Damon was trying to ride that the air was hammer. not good. Yeah. So, but Yamaha had a 360 kit that okay. they were given a couple riders. They gave me one and I went and tried to ride it. How was it? Do you remember much about that bike? I think it sucked. I mean, I could have probably went faster on a 250. Yeah. <laughs> I should have just rode a 250 and said, oh, it's a 360 kit. Back then, AMA didn't really do Yeah, much. they're not going to pull you They're just like, it. are your spokes tight? And put a sticker Guy's on Guy's got a cigarette hanging on his yeah. yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, your spokes are tight. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right, 91. Are you still on Yamaha? Uh, I stayed on Yamaha until I think 92. Okay. That's when Suzuki. Uh, no, yeah, 92, think... you were Suzuki. What about 91? Maybe Cowie, Team Green? I don't know. That's why I wanted to ask you. It doesn't show yeah. a, a brand. But maybe you Cowie. were on Cowie's yep. that 91. year. Huh? I remember that. Yep. 1990 probably. And then Cowie, Team Green offered me. They offered me. They they did good. Hmm. Yep. I was stoked to be on Team Green. It was a good experience for me. How'd they that? gave me like eight bikes, like 40 grand in parts and some expense yep. money. It was a good deal. I don't know what they saw in me to do that. You had some good results, but you must have gotten hurt because your season was short. Do you remember what happened? Uh, Yep. So that's when I won the World Mini, all three pro classes, right? And then I did a couple nationals, I think, or Supercross. I think I got third in a Supercross. You you did. You had a your first Supercross that year was a fifth at Anaheim. You went five, six, five. Yep. Eight, six, six, third at LA. Yep. And then that's it. After LA, your so, season's done. Yeah, but what happened was I broke my wrist. Yep, my oh. navicular, and I was off for like four months. Mm. Yep, I remember that. But you showed you showed some pretty good potential there. Yeah, so then Suzuki saw those results in Supercross and a couple other results and said, okay, we're going to hire you as not a factory rider, support rider. Okay. And it was like eight bikes, parts, and like expense money i mean it was a good program it wasn't a factory ride though okay the year you got an offer from mitch was the next year yes okay for 93 yep okay so 92 um suzuki support you 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 again had another good year you're kind of like your results are very they just march forward like Mm -hmm. uh steadily right Mm -hmm. you know you you got a top 10 right away then it was top fives and a podium then it was you know lots of podiums and a win uh, so in 92... But remember, when you get a podium then, who's winning is McGrath. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? So like... It's like a win. Yeah. So you got McGrath, you got Ryan Hughes, Swink. you got Emig. So these are all the kids in the 125 Supercross class. Yeah. So it's like a third. It's pretty dang good. Well, Jimmy Gaddis. Yeah. There was a lot of competition Jimmy Button, here. Lampson, Button. Steve Lampson. Yeah. Uh, so 19th at the opener in Houston, not awesome. Do you remember what happened there? What year? 92. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, but then you were third at Anaheim, fourth at Seattle, second in Vegas, 
Um, lots of top fives. And then uh, let's see where it ends here. L.A. Uh, Kenworthy. So top some top ten outdoors too. So pretty decent year. And Suzuki, were they giving you any factory parts or no? no. Just bikes. No, Mitch. Mitch. Mitch was doing my motors in suspension, bones. Yep. I'm telling you, Pro Circuit helped me out a lot. Mitch and Bones were so awesome to me. Yeah, they were. They were uh, really good. They took care of a lot of people, man. It's surprising. And then, okay, so let's talk about '93. Um, now let me let me ask you: at this point in your career, because this was really before I knew you, were you focused and training and like fully into it? Yeah, I was. Okay, I was. Like the first time I ever drank alcohol was well, my 23rd birthday, because I was focused. Right, I want I wanted to be one of the guys, so. <clears throat> Like we talked about earlier, it's like, I didn't believe I could do it, which is like the worst thing an athlete could <laughs> yeah. ever think, right? But I wanted it. I wanted it really bad. But I just thought it was too out of reach for me for some reason. I, I don't know. Man, just, and I can totally relate to that. Yeah, what, I know. What I wonder, is that? I wonder what that is. I think a couple of things. I think about it and I think that like, number one, your foundation, your stability and like your confidence, your security in who you are, right? I think that when you're young, if you have a lot of traumatic stuff going on, and this is just me, right? So I, there may be different views out there. But for me, <clears throat> I know what I used to think. It was like, no, nah, that, yeah, you know, things were not going to be okay. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Things are tough. And it's like, no, I can't really like be the guy. I can't really go out there and win. Can you? You, mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? So all that was in the back of my mind. At, but I really did want to do it. My desire was there. Mm -hmm. It was there as much as anybody. But it's just my confidence and my security it was not there at all. And I didn't really have any guidance connected with I was a punk and wouldn't listen to anybody, really. Well, that's every kid. I, I was yeah. the same well, way. Well, I don't know if it's every kid. Well, I th okay. I th it's common. Dude, I'm telling we'll you, I keep common. going back to yeah. Jeremy. And like, I think he listened. Mm. I think all the best guys do listen. I think they have a learner's heart, a learner's disposition. And they're like, I want to be the very best. What do I have to do? Yeah. Oh, I'll listen to that guy with the, was the very best before. Uh, look at Ricky. He whatever Johnny O said, he did. He didn't question it. Yeah, see, isn't that crazy? I, I wouldn't listen to anybody. I don't know that I would have done that. So I got a story about that. So like in '93, I showed some promise. I like, you know, I was up front. I got third at the first 250 Outdoor National, and I was riding good. I was like, you know, with Stanton and Mike Kudrowski. I, I felt good. And Suzuki wanted to try some conventional forks. Do you remember Suzuki yep. did that? Yep. So they hired Bob Hanna to come on board. And I think one of his roles was to like help me and, you know, some other kids just mentally and talk to us. And I remember being at Glen Helen and we were testing the forks and stuff. And we would sit there and he was talking to me about like different things. And in my mind, this is legit, and this is what an idiot I am. I'm thinking, why would I listen to you? I'm six seconds a lap faster than you today. You, you know what I'm saying? I have Bob Hanna, like a guy that's the guy that has been there, that has done it, and he's trying to talk to me. And I, and in my mind, I'm thinking, he's old. He's, <laughs> he's slow. I'm six seconds. Why would I ever listen to him? You know what I'm saying? It's like, I totally do. what a punk. I know exactly what you're saying. Just shut up and listen and you might be able to do something. I don't know if that's maturity. I don't know if it's, um, but I know exactly what you're saying because I go back all the time for my career and I say, God, if I'd have just found somebody like Ricky did and just found a mentor and, and did what they said. But would you listen? That's so, so that, no, I don't think yeah, I would have because yeah. I had your brother who yep. was actually a great mentor for me mm -hmm. he knew what it took and he what it didn't what it take yep. i had mitch early on 
If I'm not going to listen to Mitch, <laughs> right? then I'm not going to listen to anybody. Dude, I turned Mitch down. Like, how <laughs> dumb is that? You and I are a couple of idiots. That's, <laughs> that's where I'm finding <laughs> all this shit. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Well, That's okay, funny. so go take us into this '93 season. You do great '92. Okay. You're on the you're on the box. Second in Vegas. You've got to have teams talking to you at this point. You do. Tell me the options you had going into '93. And '93 would have been. Mitch was '91 uh, and two. He had the P Honda deal that was transitioning to Cal. Yeah, so that was my biggest thing. So like, Mitch offered me a ride for the '93 season, and I was stoked. I was like, yeah, I get to ride Hondas for Mitch. I'm super pumped. I know the Hondas are good. And just a couple seasons before, I rode Cowies, right? And they were good. I did great on them. I loved Cowies. And um, Suzuki offered me this deal as well. Yeah, first, they offered me another support ride. I said, oh, no way. I'm not going to do another support ride. I got a factor, you know, contract with uh, Pro Circuit. So I'm going to do that. Suzuki called me back and they said, we'll give you a factory ride, but we'll also give you a two-year deal so your next year we'll put you on a 250. You know, for 250 Supercross, 250 Outdoor National. Because that was, you know, the path that I was on. Sure. And um, so just being young and just looking at, at face value, not really digging in and thinking about what it really is. What am I really signing up for? Who am I going to be hanging out with? What are my mentors? Who's there to help me mentally? I'm just thinking to your contract, factory Suzuki, gold forks, you, 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 you know, stupid. Titanium pipes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, I kind of joke about it, but that's the reality of it. Yeah, but I don't know, man. Like, Mitch sw switching to a different bike. So I went into Mitch. Two year deal. Yep. Like there, there was a lot of things. Yep. I think a lot of people would have looked at that yep. deal. The Suzuki 125 was great. Dude, it was good. Great, great bike. Yeah. I the jumped triples that other, uh, yeah, that yeah. people weren't doing in 93. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I did go into Mitch and I said, hey, Suzuki offered me a two year deal. And he said, oh, I can't, you know, I can't do anything on the 250. And I was just like, okay. I'm going to sign with Suzuki. And he was bombed. He was like, okay. So, but, but he, but he was, he wasn't mad. He was just, no, no, he wasn't yeah. mad at me. He understood. Did he try to talk you out of it? <laughs> nope. He wasn't mad. He said, okay. And then he went on to win, win the title with Gaddis. With I know, that had Gattis, to probably, yeah. um, for yeah. him had to feel good for you. Heck yeah. It felt yeah. good to him. He's like, yeah. for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But I didn't really like, I, I was never mad at Mitch. Mitch has always been incredible yeah. to me and super kind and always like, he's done nothing but help me. But I'm just saying, I don't, I think a lot of people faced with that decision would have done the same thing you did. I don't think you were, if he was going to stay on Hondas and it was more, and he would say, I'll give you a two year deal on the 125s, then maybe yeah. you'd have been smarter to yeah. do that. But it, yeah, it wasn't. It was a lot of unknowns, yeah. and you had a, a known thing over here. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and for me to make my decision, I had me Yeah. to make the decision. What am I, 18 years old, 19 years old? And I had, I mean, I had nobody really to say, hey, what should I do? You didn't have what an agent? You, no. Yeah. Like, what should you do about this? Like, should I, should, what should I be thinking about? When I'm going in to like sign what these questions agreements. should I ask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What? Sh yeah. What are the important things that I need to have in place for me to be successful? So, you know, the, the sport was so different back then that I don't think there was a lot of agents, was there? Uh, Dave Stevenson was kind yeah, of the only, and he would only yeah. handle the very top guys, yeah. and he was really there more wasn't. Of a, there wasn't. There wasn't. It was the guys with parents that were involved, like you know, Jeremy. Right, I His keep. Parents going, would I go keep. In? Well, no, they wouldn't go in. They would like. They would like communicate with him. Hey, you know, you handle it this way. Handle it this way. Jeremy left Pro Circuit at one point, and his parents or Jeremy, I don't forget who it was, made him go in, sit down with Mitch, and say, "I'm not going to ride for you anymore." Instead of calling on the phone or anything like, actually going to face like a man, right? As you know, with integrity. Hmm. Did you, you didn't hear the story? I did. I, I've yeah, heard yeah. it before. Jeremy cried. <laughs> I heard it. Yeah. yeah. Mitch made him cry, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, but, that doesn't but, surprise but, but, dude, you take your hat off to him for doing that. Yeah. To the parents. To the To Jack and Ann. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because as a kid, you wouldn't just naturally do that. Right. I don't think so. You have parents that say, no, this is the right way to handle right. it. Right. Mm-hmm. Ah, crazy. So anyway, so one of the things that I would have thought about, hindsight, right? You look back and one of the things that I would have thought about would be like, who are going to be my teammates, mm. right? What influence are they going to be? Who who is really wants to win? What who's the team manager? How is he going to be able to guide me, right? You know, so, the Suzuki was really good. So I would, but but knowing Mitch was going to build a good bike too, yeah. You know, so that wasn't an issue. So, but just devil's advocate, it, it's not like Pro Circuit. The reputation they have now. Right. It's not He was like, new yeah, he, yeah. In, in the racing world. Like three years, right? 91, years. 92 on the Honda with his team. Yeah. And then before that, he was helping guys. And yeah. he was he was definitely... Yeah, um, yeah so it was two years, right. Well, you're making me feel better. Like my decision was No, dude, your, your decision would... I'm telling you, a lot of people would have made the same You call. would have made the same decision, huh? Probably. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That Suzuki was good. It was it, really it was the really, bike. That 125 ripped. Yep. yep. The 250 I remember is not great. My 250 was okay. Was it? Okay. In 93. I got some like top fives in 250 well, Supercross. Well, I know. I think Let, let's look at 93 because six. this was a really good year for you. Um, so at the opener, you got a second in 93. And I was trying to figure who won East the, West. Was it Swing? Who who won in 93? Gaddis. Houston. Gaddis won the opener. Yep, That's right. It's the, the only opener. one he won. Yep. And then Doug Henry was third. I got second. Doug Henry was third. Button was, me and Button were battling Jimmy Button in his grip. His grip fell, fell off. off on the face right of the triple. the triple. <laughs> Dude, I remember. Uh, it's funny that you're, okay. You're bringing up a lot of memories. Poor this, JB. This Houston 93 <laughs> was my first Supercross ever. Oh, serious? And my mechanic, Brian Pryor. You know Brian yep, Pryor? I know Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to hate me telling this story again. Getting my bike ready for the, uh, for the LCQ. I crashed in the heat or something. I'm going uh, to the LCQ. You weren't stressed at all, were you? Oh, you come on. You know me. I'm <laughs> losing my mind. He changes an air filter, forgets to take the rag. He stuffs a bunch of rags in there, forgets to take them out. So I'm up on the line for the LCQ, oh, boy. and it sucks rags. Oh, you're done. Sorry, Pry Bar. I had to throw you under the bus again. So that was, that. I didn't qualify. <laughs> that was the only Supercross in my whole career I didn't qualify for. Really? Yeah. And it's not your fault. Well, I don't know if I would have, but <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't because of that story. <laughs> Okay, so Gaddis wins this one. It's the only race he wins yeah, all year. One, yeah, he even fell with three laps to go, like wadded it. So he was Played legit it. fast. Yeah, yeah, he, he didn't luck no, into No, he this. was fast. Yeah, I mean, if you go through back Jimmy Gaddis's career, he was dominant eighty expert on a mini. There, on a mini, he was you a legend. Couldn't really yeah. beat him. Yeah, anybody. Mm. And then he moved. He he was legit. He yep. was solid. I want to say he went to factory Suzuki right away, like ninety or ninety one, right? Yep. And then just. Yeah. For whatever reason, he had some struggles, injuries. I think. Yeah. I'd love to have him on the show, actually. You don't. You haven't had him. No. Oh, well, yeah. he's back got, back east somewhere. At a campground, running a campground. Yeah. <laughs> hey, awesome kid, though. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. kind of a crazy family. Yep. <laughs> it's, Were they? I his dad know. and brother are wild, man. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Like, what do you mean by that? Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into it too much <laughs> right here, but they're, right. they're 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 you know Jimmy Gaddis. He's Jimmy, awesome. He's awesome. I love yeah. you, Okay, so second at Anaheim the next weekend. Who won that one? Um, Damon Huffman, maybe. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. That's when Michael Pichon was racing our class, yep. too. Yep. Yeah. He came to San... He won San Diego. Yeah. Yeah. So you won the next weekend in Seattle. That was your first uh, win. Yep. Um, so a 2-2-1 at that point, you're... Were you leading two, points? 2 one I was leading points. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Uh, yep. So... At this point, you get your first win. What does that feel like? Your points leader? Too good to be true. Like, honestly, like, oh, you, you know, something's going to happen. Like, in, that's in the back of my mind, right? O- only in the very back of my mind. Not like, not like, yeah, I know I can do this. You I were peacocking around, but inside there was doubt. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was probably the most arrogant <laughs> No, honestly, I was I was extremely arrogant. I think, right? Mixed with extremely insecure. Maybe that's why you were 
outwardly so arrogant yeah, because yeah. inside super that, that's insecure. true right anytime super. you have a guy who's real look yeah, at me it's like dude you're probably insecure, insecure. Yeah. so i was very insecure um but it, but I, but I showed it by being like cocky and like, oh yeah, I, I'm the man. I could do this. I'm like, but yeah. inside, just like, oh, I can't believe I'm here. So, and this is about yeah. the time I maybe met you or um, was definitely paying attention yeah. to racing, mm-hmm. obviously, because I'm turning pro, and that was the impression. And I, I was got. the guy that was up front, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that was the mm-hmm. impression I got of you. Wow, Phil, he's like big, good-looking dude. He's winning. He's factory Suzuki. He's lead. You know. Yeah. You had it all together as far as I, I was concerned. Right. From the outside, right? Yeah. It looks like that a lot of times, but you don't know what people are going through or what they're thinking. And it's tough. Yeah. It's super interesting to me. Um, all right. So Pashawn won the next one in San Diego. You're third. Then you go and do 250 Supercross again, um, which I think is still a great idea. I'm surprised more guys aren't doing right. it. They should. They, they should. Think. I think it's better to keep racing. So is Jet Lawrence going to do that at all or no? Uh, he said maybe Daytona, so we'll, we'll see. Daytona? Jeez, pick a good one, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, he'll be up for outdoors. Um, and you actually, you, you go to Tampa and got a ninth on the 250, so you are you hop right in, you're competitive. Then this is back when the series was all mixed up. Fourth at Gainesville at the first national. Yep. Dude, that's... Uh, well, I got a third the first moto. And this is in the 250 class. Yeah. Kudrowski won. Stant was second. And I remember the last, like, four laps, I was catching the catching Stanton. And I pull off the track. I'm like... I was just... I passed Bradshaw, passed, like, Chicken, and, you know, a lot of guys. You know? I would, so how, how in the world does that not equate to confidence for you? <sighs> Still just that seed of doubt inside. It, it, it may be added to my confidence, right? Okay. I'm not saying that it didn't. It may be added, but to be elite, to be the very best, there needs there's no doubt. Yeah. There's only I want to win and I can win and I'm gonna like I and I'm gonna be extremely angry if I don't. Like you, you know what I'm saying? I do. So coming from extreme like doubt, it probably did get better, but it wasn't like. Yeah. You got a sixth at Pontiac in the 250. Yeah. <laughs> like you're. I, it, that it, year, right? I'm yeah. riding 125. Yeah. yeah. Um, sixth at Indy. Then you got a fifth at Southwick on the 250. You go to Pasadena, you got second. Who won that? Huffman won that one, huh? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, uh, high point. And then San Jose, was this the weekend where the championship went sideways for you? Yes. The clutch so, broke off. So. Yep, yep. Tell me. I tell think me I was li- so I think I went to Dallas or Irving before that? Um, yeah, that was before. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Irving was eighth. You yeah, got eighth so, there, so there. on the first lap, um, I was probably fifth or something on the first lap. And Grayson Goodman knocked me down. I got up and last in the main event. So I got eighth. And then the next weekend in San Jose, first lap, Ray Crum. You remember Ray Crum? I remember Ray Crum. Jumps in front of me and I hit him on the first lap, fell, broke my clutch lever off. What place did I get? Seventh. So you rode the whole main and got seventh. So, dude, I rode the whole main with no clutch and got seventh. I was pinning it. Because I remember because there was a double before these whoops. Whoops were pretty gnarly, and we were kind of jumping through them in the first lap with no clutch. Off the double, I just shifted up, and I I can't burr, burr, jump through them. What? Oh, nah, nah. And I got through them. I was like, nice every lap. <laughs> Dude, I came back to seventh with no clutch. Jumping the triple, I think. Yeah. That's sketchy on a 125. Yep. Okay, so going into Vegas, and I, I remember this um, – because, like I said, I was doing some of these races. I don't think I raced that one. At San Jose or at uh, Pasadena, I blew my ACL out. So I wasn't racing, but I was at Vegas. And I remember they brought you guys, you and Jimmy Gaddis down. The points must have been really close, huh? Like three points, I think, or something like that. So I remember... And he was leading now. Yeah. Jimmy had the lead, and they were interviewing both of you before the race, like in opening ceremonies type of deal. And you said something like... 
You were you were running your mouth trying to get in his head. Uh, I was doing it all day, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, they were just talking about. And Jimmy is such a humble, great guy, Christian. <laughs> And he's like, you know, you know, I'm just really trying my hardest this season. I'm so blessed to be in this situation to even like go for a title. He's just like awesome, right? Yeah. And then me, <laughs> dude, it was awful. I think back and like it was awful. I'm like, yeah, I'm just so bummed that uh, he might win this because I'm such a better writer. And like in <laughs> the whole crowd, boo! And I was like, yeah, <laughs> just. Uh, it, didn't, it, it, it honestly is humiliating, right? Or I don't really feel that humiliated about it. I just think that like, it's just something to teach my kids, right? Yeah. Hey, listen, dude, be humble and just do your best. Yeah. Don't be a punk because it's going to get you nowhere. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you, you even know. lost the fans, I guess, with that. I don't remember. Yeah, it's you, just so dumb. It's like. Didn't Jimmy say something like, uh, I came here to. Kick Eat butt bubble and gum chew or... bubble gum and I'm all out of bubble gum. Yeah. <laughs> Kick ass and chew bubble gum and I'm out of bubble gum. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. So like, honestly, if I was going for a championship, which I was, and somebody was going to beat me, I would pick him because he's such a nice, humble guy. And yeah. He's a Christian and like, just what a great influence he is on people. Yeah, totally. Mm. At the time for you though, uh, the race, you got a third. I didn't got even know. A third. So I line. So I think I had the fastest heat race. So I get to line up first, right? The main event. <clears throat> I think maybe Gaddis won his heat race, maybe. So he lined up right next to me. And I'm like, okay. And he was a great starter, right? So right out of the gate, he moved over on me and just a couple spokes out of my front wheel. No way. Ripped him out. So. <clears throat> I mean, that that didn't change how I rode, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I mean, I was like, I'm going to go the best I can. But anyway, when he moved over on me, I think he whole shot it, him and Damon Huffman. And um, I started maybe 10th or 12th because he moved over and, you know, I had to let off, mm -hmm. which was good on him, right? Racecraft. He did, he did, he good. did his job. He got, yeah. got the job done. I didn't. Were you bummed after that? I mean, how, how I was did you really take bummed, it? yeah. I was really bummed that I did. I didn't win. And, you know, on the podium, I have my shirt off and Amy, put your shirt back on us. I didn't, you know, I, I mean, I'm telling you, I was a punk. Mm. Like, and I think back then it's like, you know what? I shouldn't have won. You know, it's just like, you think about stuff that you've done in the past and it's like, <clears throat> what makes a kid be a punk like that? And why do you think you know everything? What's the answer to that? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. I definitely did my share. Maybe not things. parents. Maybe, right? The lack of parenting saying, hey, chill out. You're you're not like the man. Hmm. I I don't know. I don't know what it is. Well, all right. So you, you get second in that hmm. championship. Um, oh, tell me about this. So outdoors... You rode the 250, and you did great. Eighth at Red Bud, fifth at Unadilla. You got a podium at Glen Helen. And Glen Helen was, that was my first national. That was the 140-minute moto, One hotter than dude, balls out hot. there. Yes, extremely hot. It was a 40-minute moto, huh? Yeah. Yeah, One because you had to qualify to get to the one moto. Yep, they were they were trying a new format. DeCoster and some other guy were behind it, and trying to make a better TV package. So you could just have one final. Yeah. And it was terrible Glen Helen conditions. Smoggy. Remember how smoggy yep. it was? It was you couldn't even see across the track. Yep. And uh, I remember I almost blacked out in the race. My dad, I pulled in. I was going to quit. My dad said, get out there. You <laughs> oh, don't, good for yeah. him. So I got... No, uh, I'm tired. <laughs> I think I got 15th maybe. So you, you basically get 15-15, which gave me enough points for number 90. Yeah. Nice. Next oh. year. Yeah, but you are podium, dude. With who? Uh, Stanton? Uh, who, who? Maybe Stanton, Larocco, Steve Lampson. I think. I mean, you're standing up day. there on the box with some. Bradshaw. Oh yeah, bad dudes in the premier class. I didn't start up front either. I came through and went by a lot of people. John Dowd, 
people don't know, but John Dad, have you had him on the show? No, he's tough to get out here yeah. too. He hates California. Anyway, um, Dowdy was in the class. That dude was solid. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of good guys. Yeah. Yeah, a lot Cooper? of good guys. Guy Cooper. Remember they had that step up that he, that was upside down every lap. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Super Coop. That's where I passed Cooper. I was right behind him when I caught him and he did that and the, everybody was going crazy. And I was like, stayed low and raw. I was racing, right? Yeah. He was showing. Yeah. Right in that area. That's <laughs> funny. So you all season long, even though you missed that title, what a great year. Yeah. I had a good year. Yep. For you to do that in both classes is, yep. dude, that's impressive. Yep. <clears throat> um, a good year is an up and comer, right? Yeah. And I feel like mm -hmm. you're. And like I said, this was about the time I was meeting you, getting, you know, watching you in 94. I think that's I moved when in you with moved you. in with us. End of 93. Right? Yeah. So was your fitness good? I mean, I, I remember you being, I think, wow, Phil's really like dedicated. You would go running all the time. And I, and I was, yeah. yeah. So that's the thing, right? I, I would go running all the time. I would ride my bike all the time. Like I was, I was fit. Yeah. Like I was focused. I wanted to win. You know, I didn't believe I could, but I wanted to. Yeah. No drinking, no partying. I mean, I would, you, you know, I was focused. But the problem is <clears throat> I didn't listen to anybody, right? And it's like you should only do so much cardio um, when if you're going to be a pro dirt biker, right? You need strength too. And naturally, I'm built naturally like a cardio guy, right? So I cardio. So everybody's built different. Your strength, right? So you should probably uh, invest in more cardio. You already have a whole bunch of strength. I should have invested in more strength, mm. brute strength. Yeah. So when my reserve was done, I had like 7% body fat. And I was proud of that back then, you know, because I would run and bike so much. You'd but, tear your shirt off on the podium and be like. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but the problem is, is once you get into a moto and you deplete your energy, you're done. You have no reserve. Mm. You know, that's. You need the strength. So <clears throat> so when I hit a wall, I really hit a wall. Yeah. Mm. It's funny because you had like, you also had Randy who was probably giving you advice. I didn't listen to him. I tell my, yeah. Isn't that I, frustrating? Yeah. I like, I sometimes get so <laughs> mad at myself. Like if I could just, if I would have just listened. But I talked to Mitch about this. I've said, man, you must feel like it must be Groundhog Day for you. When you get these riders who come in, they're super talented. They have everything they need if they would just listen and dodge some of the potholes that you can steer them around. <laughs> that you've already been through and you know where they are. You're saying, okay, when you go around this corner, go the inside because there's a huge pothole. No. No, that inside Dude. line's good. <laughs> what, uh, what does he say about that? He laughs. He just goes, nah, man, I, I can only say what I can say. And yep. they're either going to listen or they're not. I think he's kind of just... He's realized it. He can mm -hmm. yell and scream and pound his fist on the table and they're either going to listen or they're not. And, and I think it, I would say it's a pretty even split between the kids who will listen and kids who don't. That would be my guess. Yeah. I, w I, w I would <clears throat> say it wouldn't be split. I would more say kids the kid, don't more listen. kids yeah. don't listen. More kids think that they know what's going on. All right, so going to 94, um, second year on your Suzuki deal, and you're 250 full-time? 250 full-time. I was stoked. Was the bike good? So it was okay. <clears throat> but during that season, they were just starting to test dual ignitions. You know, you, you remember that Where you all? could switch from one mountain. You could to switch, yeah. yeah. Your start, and then you go switch. It's like the kill button, right? But there's two switches, two modes. And I remember my bike kept cutting out. Like, you know, with that dual ignition, it bro, once in a while it would cut out. And I kept telling my mechanic, hey man, this thing's cutting out sometimes. So, and I was like, I don't want to race with it. So from my understanding, they left it on there. Mm. So I show up to Orlando, the first supercars of the year. And I think it's in the main event right before the triple and my bike cut out right before going up the face of the triple and I jumped over the bars or off the back or I forget what it was jacked my knees up pretty good not super bad but pretty good 
And so I was kind of limping around and I think Houston or something was the next weekend. Yep. No, well, it says Daytona. Oh, well, your results show Daytona. How did I do it? Daytona. 20th. You get 20th in no, Orlando. No, it wasn't Daytona. Okay. There was races in yeah, between. Yeah. I'll tell you why. <clears throat> because I think it was Houston. So I don't think they ever took the ignition off. They Still. kept it on. Still. Who was your mechanic? Was it Dino? Uh, Nope. Nope. It was, um, he was Pastrana's mechanic for a while. <clears throat> um, Man, hmm. I forget his name. Super nice guy. There was Jim Danforth, Caveman. I'm trying to think of who else was mechanics back then. Um, hmm. Ezra's mechanic, huh? Yeah, I'd rather not say his name. Okay. Because, well, anyway. I mean, super nice guy. He was great. He's only doing what, so, you know, Japan is telling him. Right. Whoever, right? So... Was he your mechanic in 93 too? He, no, Ed Longacre was. Ed Longacre, okay. Yeah, so they changed. <clears throat> so Houston was the next, you know, weekend, and I didn't ride all week trying to heal my knees up. And um, there was a step on, brought off over a knuckle before the triple, and I stepped on and went to go off, and my bike cut out. Oh. Dual ignition that I told him I did not want to race with. Went over the bars, blew both my knees out. Just jacked me up. Like it was bad. I, th I thought I was gonna die. It hurt so bad. Did you tear I, ACLs? What'd you um, do? Yep, yeah, both ACLs or PCLs. Oh. I forget which ones, but both of them. Yeah, I was done. And um, I tried to ride. I, I wanted to do it. Right, I wanted to, and I tried to ride, but there was no way. I needed surgery, and I was off for. I think I tried to ride San Diego, and that didn't work. And well, you only took. Like a month and a half off. Yeah, and that was stupid. I should have gone. So you weren't fully. No, yeah. heck no. And and I was injured. Like, so Daytona, you said Daytona was next, but I remember being at Daytona and I poor showing, right? I'm not healthy. You know, the guys I'm racing with are the best in the world. Those guys are healthy, strong, and I don't know. How did I do at Daytona? 20th. Yeah. And then you didn't race again until May 1st at Hangtown. Yeah. So I remember Hide was the racing manager for Suzuki. I remember he was there and he came up to me after and said, uh, who gave you authorization to race this race? He was mad because I did so bad. And I said, nobody, you, you know, I just wanted to race. But I should have, looking back, I should have got healthy because it made me look bad, right? Yeah. So... Yeah. And that, that was an awful year. Yeah, you had a seventh at Bud's Creek, 11th at the Seattle Supercross. Yeah, yeah, and I was injured all year. Yeah. And then I remember I did take some time off. I forget when, the Outdoor Nationals. And um, Well, you didn't, you didn't ride anything in July, past June 26th. So maybe you took the rest of the summer off. So I remember that year I got back kind of healthy went to southwick and i think i got like a fourth or fifth the first moto and then the second moto i broke my collarbone uh snap <laughs> after yeah, that, being out for so long again that was your last national that yeah. summer june 26th yep you got 14th overall but yeah yep because i did so well the first moto Jeez. and i remember between motos i was off for months and months before that with my knees and i remember because i passed swing the last couple laps in the first moto, I think it was a fourth or a fifth. And he was actually stoked for me. Came over, good job, man. I'm like so pumped for you. Yeah. Second moto, I broke my collarbone. That's cool. Who would do that? Yeah, right. You just passed Swing him. Stone. Hey, man, good job. Yeah. He, he was a good friend of mine. Swing you knew him pretty well, huh? Yep, really well. What, um, yep. what memories do you have of him? Shh. I mean, he was a wingnut, too. <laughs> <laughs> what memories was he, a, he was 80 expert. He came to Glen Helen for a Golden State, number 257 on a Kawasaki yeah. 80. Dude, that kid was fast. DMC. Uh, DMC. KX80. Yep. Bad ass. You couldn't beat him. He won Ponca City World Mini. Like, yeah. I think I told him this uh, back when we were racing, but I have this vivid memory. One of the first amateur nationals I ever went to was uh, World Mini, the old Henderson one. <clears throat> and he was, you know, this team green god. Which With a start that's like a mile long. Yeah. <laughs> Two miles long into a left, into a ski jump that sent you 800 feet in the air. Um, but I, I remember sitting 
in his pit, just like in awe, looking at him. He was eating a little fruit cup. And I just, I don't know, it's burned into my brain. I fruit cups. <laughs> I just, Dad, was, get, get me fruit cups for next his weekend. His bike, the way he carried himself, his gear, like everything about him, I was just like, wow. Dude, he was legit. Yeah. He was so talented. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, yep. So it's, I remember being on Suzuki <clears throat> with him, just a side note. And this is when JMB... John Michelle Bell, right? Came from Europe and he was factory Honda and he was number one. He already won a Supercross title. Mm-hmm. We would go out for practice, come in, and JMB would walk over to his truck and ask him questions about the track. Oh, really? No, he was obviously a listener, right? Would listen, JMB. He was the man and he would come over and talk to Swingster. Mm. Hey, what do you think about this line? Because he knew that Swingster was so talented that he would do stuff other people wouldn't do. There was a jump in Seattle one year. Are you sure it wasn't San Jose? I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent. It was in the kingdom. Okay. And I can't remember what year it was. He was on factory Suzuki. So it's probably 93, four. Yeah. Probably 94. Cause I, I would have been there. And, um, Anyway, I, I can't remember the setup. It was like a left, and then there was a step up thing that guys were kind of kind of going up and on and then off. And he was seat bouncing up over the whole thing. Do you remember yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it was gnarly. Jeremy wasn't doing it. No one was doing it. He would do some stuff so that was crazy. I think that year at San Jose Supercross, you know, you'd come out of a corner, they would have a backward ski jump, a bump, and then the triple. Yeah. He'd come out of the corner and hit the backward ski jump and like over the first. Jump of the jump triple. of the triple, and I'm like, dude, like, you're not gonna do that in the race. Why did you do that? That's like huge. Oh, I just knew I could do it. It's like, okay. Yeah, he had tons of talent, man. Yeah, pretty sad. Did you ever talk Super to him sad. there at the end oh, of yeah, the I last did. couple of years? Yep. You you kind of kept in touch yep. with him, huh? Yep. Depression, and then alcoholism. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was just on a bad road, man. It was sad. I tried to talk to him about it, but that's what he was doing. Mm. Yeah, he um, he would make me laugh. Like the, he, that guy, kind of when I was in, you know, interacting with him. Ninety it would have been ninety four, five, six, seven, kind of that window. He just didn't care about anything. No, like, horrible attitude. <laughs> horrible attitude. <laughs> A punk, <laughs> right? Like full punk, horrible attitude. I love the guy. Yeah. I used to go stay with him. He would stay with me. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. He scared me. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> I was always intrigued by him and I would talk to him. I liked him, but I was like, Ugh. dude, he was, he was a wing nut. Yeah. <laughs> well, rest in peace, Swingster. Yep. Um, okay. So the end of this 94 season. Not great. I mean, you do have a couple of bright spots, but yeah, no, not I, great. I couldn't race all year, really. So, did you have right. anything going into '95? No. Nope. Were you talking to teams? Suzuki. So I tried, of course, right. But Suzuki was like, "Oh, we're done with you. We're not going to use you anymore," and that really pissed me off because it was like, I think it was their fault, right? Mm. With that dual ignition, I was like, I told you guys I did not want to ride with this. And you kept it on, and you started my year off injured. Yeah. You jacked me up. Mm. But, you know, it's like there was no faithfulness and dirt bikes. Or Listen, outside of people, um, like like we both mentioned Mitch Payton, I feel like he's a very loyal guy. Yeah, yep. When I broke my femur in 96, he came into the hospital, said, hey, don't worry about a ride next year. You're good. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Outside of people like that, I would say Phil Alderton was probably one of those guys. Um, uh, you know, maybe the Gibbs family during there, they would have been maybe that way. Like Very few, huh? They would have some loyalty. None of these factories, they yeah. don't give a crap they, yeah. about you. Like, oh, we got somebody else that's going to get a result for us. See ya. Yeah. We don't like, yeah. It's a, that's a reality that... Uh, <clears throat> It's hard to get young guys to believe, yeah. but it's like, look, you better look out for yourself because they're not. Right, right. They're not. So I was scraping by, right? I mean, I was looking for whatever I could do. So what did you land on? It was... Uh... I think a Kawasaki in Mexico. I rode Cowies okay. for a Kawasaki in Mexico because... Oh, Takati. <clears throat> yep. 
That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, because like, I think at the end of 94 is when I first started going to Mexico. Did you ever go to the, you did. I did. Yeah. I did. Uh, um, got a lot think... of stories about those, those. Oh my trips. gosh. Some we can't tell. <laughs> but anyway, I remember <clears throat> that's, yeah, my first trip to Mexico was Monterey. And I remember I won. I beat Jeff Emig. He was down there. They paid him a lot of money to come and I beat him. Yep. My first trip. So was that 90? Was, was that 94? 94, maybe. Yep. Ryan Hughes got third. Okay. So that's, you know, that's how Kawasaki, I was on a Suzuki still. Kawasaki, Mexico was there. And, um, <laughs> you know, I won in their hometown, right? So I was, yeah. you know, pretty good to them. So they decided to support me in the U.S. Mm. Oh, that's how that came about. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. And then, you know, and then the off season, that's when they were doing the Supercross series in Mexico. Mexico City, Monterey, Guadalajara. Yeah. I did, uh, I think, Guadalajara and Monterey with you. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Remember, yep. we take all our old gear down there. <laughs> you Dude, sell your just, old gear. <laughs> you'd make a lot of money, right? Yeah. A thousand bucks, probably. To us, that was a lot I back got some, then. I got some funny stories about that race that I, I can't I got, tell. But. Yeah, me too. I got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, I came back for something because oh, I was riding for Mitch at the time. So I had, I can't remember what I had going on, but you guys took a bus right no i didn't oh you didn't I, do that no, either i flew okay i think you flew didn't you fly with us i didn't go to uh was acapulco mm -hmm. or what where was the yeah. beach race um it was a um mazatlan or uh guadala no puerto vallarta puerto vallarta yep they took a bus from the, i didn't even go yes. to puerto vallarta no i, I flew went. to puerto okay v dude it was awful <laughs> well the stories from that bus ride are epic though <laughs> oh yeah i think denny stevenson like, yeah bud man a lot of people on that bus mike jones <laughs> Mad Mike Jones. What's he doing now? You got to have him on. Dude, I'm he telling you. He scares me too. You have to have him on. Mad Mike, where are you at? Yeah, come on, um, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I just just by the names we've listed that were on that bus ride, you can imagine a, yeah. what was it, like a th two-day bus ride. From... And it didn't stop, right? Brian Deegan was there. <laughs> yeah, so in he rode, yeah, he rode yeah. the bus. Uh, dude, I remember just all week was a party. Yeah. And the, and then probably a, or the hotel next to us, there was this one company that had all these like girls that like model girls from the U.S. that came down. They were staying there that week, and it was bad news. Well, great it news back like, then. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it was it was awful. So, so at this time, were you partying? Were you like drinking and partying? Did that start about? I was. Year? Yep. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to think in 94, let's back up a little bit. End of 1993, I'm looking for a mechanic. I'm buddies with Jimmy Button. He connects me with your brother. Randy says, Hey, come out and live with me in California. We'll, you know, it'll be better for your program to be out here. Mm -hmm. So I move in with Randy and you and his wife, Miriam. And for me, uh, like they're really fun memories. <laughs> I really like, I really had a lot of fun at that time. And, I'm 18 years old. I literally just graduated high school and came and out. And I didn't ride with you a whole bunch back then, did I? No, because we were you were on different programs. You huh? were at the factory mm -hmm. uh, Suzuki track up in Atalanto, which was terrible, by the way. Terrible. What a terrible place. When and I was doing Mitch's team, so I, I had to be at the Cowie stuff a lot. Oh, but when yeah, it would yeah, rain, yeah. we'd all go to the hills. I, though, again, <coughs> 94 is some of my best memories. One, because I love your brother so much. And he and I in a box van just have a blast traveling around the country. But like getting to ride with you guys, it would rain out here in Temecula and before it was all full of houses. And we talked about this before the show, like Jeremy just, we'd all kind of just pack up and he'd, he'd find something and just jump this ridiculously technical thing. And then we'd all follow suit and try to do it. And we'd ride all day. All day out in the hills. Yeah. So fun. Yep. And so you wouldn't, do, do wouldn't people, get arrested. Do people <clears throat> do that a lot anymore? No. Just like play ride and... They'll do, uh, you know, a couple whips at the end of the day at the track or a couple transfers. People don't go to Beaumont, like top race guys. They don't go out in the hills and do what we used to do. That's a, that's a wasted day. They could be at the track doing laps. It's become so, um, we, we were probably not structured enough. They're too structured now. These kids aren't even having fun. It's a job from yeah, the day you hit yeah. the floor. Yep. So, you know, I just told you a little bit ago that, you know, I went to A2. And I was talking to Dino, 
at Kawasaki. Dean, Dean Gibson. So he was Dean your mechanic Gibson. for a while. He was my he mechanic, was my mechanic two different years. Was he? Yeah. FMF Honda and then uh, Moto World Suzuki. Really? Yeah. Nice. You guys grew up with Dean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went to high school with him. And um, anyway, Bruce Sternstrom from Kawasaki, uh, you know, just talking to him. What He was he was always cool to me. He was, was he just there hanging out? He doesn't. He's not the man. He was, no, yeah. no. He was just hanging out. Okay. And he was just like, yeah, it's just not as fun anymore. It's yeah, true. It's like, it's, I mean, they're there to win. Yeah. They're there to race, right? Which, you know, I suppose that's the natural progression as it gets more serious. But yeah. It's kind yeah. of sad too. Yeah, I don't know, but there's more money. The guys are making more money. Well, it all That's depends good. on the on the rider, right? I mean, if a rider says, "I'm all in life, all I want to do is race and win," you know, you have people like that. Cooper Webb probably. Mm. It's like, but then you have people like Jason Anderson. Maybe I don't really know him that well, but it seems I, that I, way. I, I want to have fun yeah. too. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So maybe a little bum him out a little bit, but Cooper's like, "Oh, this is great." Mm. What else do you remember from that 94 year? I remember you used to always get mad at me. <laughs> and Phil Phil still brings this up at family functions all the time. Oh, do How- you want me to tell everybody what it was? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah. So his bedroom was just like right next door. And we shared a bathroom. We shared a bathroom. Yep. And I would come, I would get up every morning and come in the, the bathroom and have a present in the toilet <laughs> from pingling. Dude, I used to get so mad. I'm like, dude, flush the toilet when you're done. What are you thinking? Like your mom doesn't live here, dude. She's not taking care of you anymore. Grow up. You get so mad. So at mad. Well, but dude, I had a reason. I had. Yeah, you had. You told me the reason. His the shower, the water pressure there. If you if you flushed, I would I would go to the bathroom and then take a shower. And if you flushed. It changed the water pre- the temperature. It would like swing. I would never want to inconvenience your shower, <laughs> for sure. So I would poop, <laughs> close the lid, take my shower, and then the idea was get out, and then I could flush but it. But you'd forget. But I'd forget every the day. lid's down. And you'd open the lid and have a grenade sitting oh, down there. Oh, dude. It was awful. <laughs> At, like, in the morning, I'm just like, what is this kid thinking? <laughs> What would I say to you? <laughs> You'd let me have it. You get pissed. You didn't like it. Uh, Understandably so. It wasn't on purpose, and it, uh, it was uh, anyway. The other thing funny. I remember is foosball. We had a foosball table. We used to man. Battle. It got competitive. We used to battle. What yeah. about darts? Do you oh, remember no. being the, into that? The, the Ben Gay line. Oh yeah. Oh, that was Goat Brecker, right? Well, that started I that. No, I don't think he started it. He might have. The Ben Gay line, well, that was GOAT. Did he start it or did he just do it? Well, I remember him starting it. I remember yeah. that was his idea. Okay, because well, who would thanks, come up with... Thanks, GOAT. GOAT for it. <laughs> who would come up with such a stupid idea? So, Dude, it was gnarly. We had a foosball Don't ever table. do this. It's brutal. We would play foosball. I mean, it was like winter stays on and it was just all night, every night. Yeah, we have a penny sitting on, remember? And we'd play for pennies. So yeah. the loser had to stand up against the wall with his shirt up and you took this penny and just throw it at their back as hard as they could. And if you could get it to land perfectly <laughs> flat, it was just like an Abe Lincoln Yep, you could see tattoo. the full imprint of a penny on your back. It was awesome. <clears throat> um, but oh. then we started playing darts and we had a regular dart line in the garage and Go Brecker comes over and says, hey, let's put one from way back here. And loser has to smear Ben Gay on his balls. <laughs> Goat is a wing nut. I love him to death. I've been trying to get him on this show. He won't return calls, but he would, you'd had to grab a little glob of Ben Gay and put it on your nuts, smear it on your balls. It was brutal. Do brutal. not recommend zero out of yep. 10 stars. Yep. And, and 10 out of 10 <laughs> pain level. You would sit there for 10 minutes. It would just be pain Do like you know- a lot, like fire. Do you know what else I remember? And nothing mm-hmm. you could do. You put water yep. on it, it almost got worse. Yep, you're done. Ten minutes. Um, I also remember mm-hmm. the Northridge earthquake. Do you remember oh, that? Oh, dude, yeah. That was during the time I was living with you. And I was laying in my bed. And I think I had a girlfriend that was with me at the time. <laughs> and I've never been in an earthquake before. It's Arizona pretty early morning. in the morning, I think. Yep. And dude, we were just, the house was just rocking. It was crazy. And I see you go darting past the door. Do you remember this? I don't remember. So it comes to a stop and I don't, I don't even know to be scared. I don't know what's happening. I'm like, what in the world is going on? 
And so I stand up and go to my door and you're in between Randy and Miriam's uh, door jam with your hands against the thing and you're looking at Randy like, what's going on? Are we okay? <laughs> and I, and I've never just, seen you so and scared. You, and you're just tripping. I was like, what, what was that? You're like, <laughs> is there construction going on? Like, uh, I didn't know what was going on. Do you remember that, yeah, that you freaked shook. out a little bit? Yeah, I'm sure I did. Earthquakes are brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never I've been seen in a you, couple. I'd never seen you be vulnerable. That's funny you remember that. Yeah, uh, it was funny. I do remember. I remember it clear as day. Um, okay, so during this time, you are starting like you're starting to party a bit. Like when did the partying really pick up? Because at I one think point, like Havasu. Because we would all year? go to like, um, what, what year is that? Like 94 or 5. Okay. Eh, a little bit. I started partying a little bit in 95. Just because I was so discouraged. You know, you don't have a factory ride anymore. And it's, you know, the way things work is if you get a factory ride back then, the satellite teams were not really existent. There was like, no lean Yamaha and yeah, Moto Triple X. A little bit, yeah. So... And then I lost my factory ride, right? So I was kind of like, oh. I was felt deflated mm. pretty pretty much. And, uh, you know, and my friends were partying and stuff. They've been doing it for years. So I was like, I don't know. I just started partying a little bit. Mm. Okay. So go into your 95 season then. You're, you're on Cowies. And I remember, um, I can't remember if this is Great Western, or 95 was... Yeah, Takati. 95 was Takati, Kawasaki, number 42, I think. When was it Dave Feeney was your mechanic? Was it 95? 95, yeah. Do yep. you remember being out yep. at the test track and your pipe fell off? Yep. Yep. That Dave, was brutal. Dave, this is a... Dave Feeney's awesome. Awesome. I love that guy. He does a great job. He was nervous, right? It was his first year as yeah, a mechanic. Yeah, first year as a mechanic. It, Mitch Payton was helping me again. And... Um, you know, working on my bikes, you know, ranching for Mitch because I was testing with Mitch that day on Cowie, Cowie's track. And uh, he was just super nervous, right? So when he put on the pipe, I think he forgot to bolt it on. He did the springs only. And going up the face of a triple, my pipe just falls off. <laughs> I heard it get all loud. I was yeah. Like, ah! yeah. And I came up short and I'm just like, I didn't, I didn't get, you know, I was like upset, but I wasn't like, yeah, Mitch was, yeah, nobody yelled at him. No, 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 just, I just, yeah. it stands out in my head because yeah. I was there that day. Yeah. And nobody, Dave, I didn't get hurt and Dave was just like, oh. yeah, got I it. felt bad for him. He went on to win championships with Zach yeah. Osborne and he's, yeah. he's uh, awesome. solid as rock. Yeah. Yeah. I just Great remember guy. that day. Yeah. So that season. Mm -hmm. How was that for so, you? So, okay. So that season actually, so. Oh, hold on. Before we get started, <laughs> let's start early that season. Cause I know you like to tell this story. We went to Reno. This was my first race I ever did with Mitch. Oh, dude. This was great. We went to Reno and did the, it was called the <laughs> Arena Cross. And it was uh, a bigger arena than a normal arena it, cross. That was cool. Yeah. Smaller than a super cross. Yep. And you rode my practice bike or something. And so Randy, you and Randy and I drove up in, a, in my box van. Why, why did you let me ride your practice? Oh, because I didn't have You didn't have a 125. So I said, I'll ride your practice bike. And you, you rode your 250, right? And or something 250, like that. Okay. I had a 250, yeah. And um, <laughs> I was so nervous and wound so tight. Dude. It's my first ride for Pro Circuit. I'm, I want to make a good yeah. impression. And you pull yeah, up on yeah, the line. But, but you say this is your first ride at Pro Circuit, but you've always been that way. You've always yeah, been yeah. wound tight. Yeah, You've always been like <laughs> getting all excited. But this <laughs> weekend was exceptionally like on steroids. <laughs> you kept asking Rand, what's wrong with him? Is he all right? <laughs> so I do remember being on the line with you, right? And this is in the 125 class. I'm on your practice bike <laughs> and I grab your bars or something. Hey, dude, good luck. And you're just... I couldn't you even barely respond, even responded, yeah. and, I, and then I hit Rand. I'm like, dude, what's wrong with him? <laughs> and Rand's like, oh, yeah, man, you, guys, you guys losing it. <laughs> and this is right before the gate drops. Too. Yeah, thirty second boards up. You know, <laughs> rubbing your four. Uh, fun. That was part of my problem. I was too uptight. If I could have chilled out a little bit, I'd have been better off. Um, okay, so go through confidence, that. right? It always go back to confidence, security, knowing you can do it, and just like relax yeah. and execute 
One dude, I'm telling you. So I tell a Jeremy so, story. No, this is not a Jeremy <laughs> okay. story. This is Cooper Webb. Mm-hmm. Tell me if you notice this. I don't know, but it looks like to me when you know I watch the highlights of the Supercrosses and they're panning the start, showing all the riders, and a lot of times it's on Cooper Webb, and he goes. Like every time I mm. see him, I think I do, right? I haven't talked to anybody about this. I I don't know, but it looks like he does. And he puts his hands on his bars really slow. Mm. Like, I'll I mean, pay, attention I mean for pay, it. pay attention. Watch this. That's a, that's a valid technique to bring your heart rate yeah, down. And, and, then his hand, when, and then when he goes to put his hands up on the bars, it's like slow motion. Mm. I'm like, whoa, that's weird. Mm. I'll have to watch that. for that. Yeah, watch. Well, Cooper Webb, I've always okay. said, especially at a season opener, it's not oh, always the yeah. fastest guy. It's the guy who can control the nerves yep. and the emotion, yep. right? Well, because it's, yeah. <laughs> you and I laugh about this yeah. all the time because we both get cold sores when, when we, we get, get stressed, stressed out. <laughs> and uh, LA Coliseum, <laughs> both of our mouths were just covered in cold sores. Just <laughs> before the season over, 97 or 97, yep. That was awful. What was that, Chaparral? Uh, I probably. You were Suzuki or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 97. I was Mitch still. How are you going to compete when you're that jacked up? When you're so stressed. Oh, well, I was riding east, but we did a west round Mm -hmm. just as a warm up. And I I got taken out in the first turn. (laughs) (laughs) I shouldn't even have been nervous. Uh, It didn't even count for me. But uh, anyway, we we both looked like we got beat up by Mike Tyson (laughs) going into that season. Our lips are all torn up. Okay, so you're on pretty much just a pro circuit Cowie that year. Yep. Night was 95. 95. Yep. And you had some decent results, man. You're sixth at Minneapolis. So so that's the thing. A lot of you hear a lot of riders like it takes a year, right, of healthy progression to be at the top. So honestly, that 95 season, now that I look back, I didn't get any injuries. I was training and, you know, I wasn't partying that much in 95, still not even a 96, 97 is when I started. Okay. So I had a good year, you know, a decent solid year that wasn't the best, but like a good building. Year. Yeah. I was able to build back up a little bit of confidence and, you know, my strength and stamina. You, and, you got a fourth at Dallas. Mm, yeah. This is 250 yep. Supercross class. Yep. Lots of top 10, 6th at High Point Outdoors, 7th at Southwick, 6th at Millville. So you were well inside the top 10 pretty much every weekend. 6th at Millville. Yeah. Nice, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I did Go great. Phil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I think that was a good building year going into the 96 season. Was that, did you also mm-hmm. have Vallejo and um, yep. uh, Shea Bentley yep. on your team, right? Yep. Okay. I remember seeing the bikes, but I just yep. didn't put that together. Hmm. That was good, man. I, I appreciated those guys from Takati, mm-hmm. from Kawasaki, Mexico. They did help me out a lot. They, they did got good. they were into the sport big there for yep. a minute. Yeah, they did good. Hmm. So any any fun stories from that year? Um, the Kawasaki, uh, Mexico, just going to Mexico, man. Those were fun times. Yeah, really fun times. Yep. They, <gasps> we made a lot of money down there too. Yeah, and I never had any sketchy mm-hmm. moments. Like, I, I know maybe it's gotten worse now, but yeah, I don't yeah, know if I'd I go down now. I can't time. believe that I didn't get arrested for this. Some of the stuff we did. Yeah, I was like, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of lawlessness down there. It was, and just you do whatever you want. Um, it was crazy. Do you know what I think <laughs> of now, and I, I don't. Back then, it never even crossed my mind. You're racing in these random little places. No medical staff. Like, what are the hospitals like there? If you got really jacked well, up. Well, we went to Mexico City, Monterey, Guadalajara. Those were all big cities. I'm sure that they have good hospitals. I'm sure. Well, what was Puerto, Puerto Vallarta? Like, I doubt uh, there's a great... But well, we didn't race in Puerto Vallarta. We just partied for a week. Oh, really? I thought uh, the race yeah, was there. How, what were the promoters thinking? Oh, we're going to, like, pay you a lot of money and set you a week on this... Like resort and pay for all your drinks. Well, they were the races. Those were that series was during the off season, so they were probably thinking, "How fun! These guys want to have a good time. Let's let's facilitate that." And we did. Dang it, they did. Yep. No, we did. (laughs) (laughs) Not they. 
Um, all right, we're gonna take a quick break here. We're about in the middle of our story. Uh, this is your Troy Lee Designs timeout. Hang tight, we're gonna be right back to finish up here with Phil Lawrence. There's a new product on the market that's gonna help you with your riding and racing, and it's Elevate Action Sports. If you've not yet gone and checked it out at elevateactionsports.com, it's a collective of riding coaches, the likes of which has never been put together. Grant Langston, Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emick, Johnny Campbell, and myself, David Pingree, bringing all of our years of experience in professional racing to one place with professionally produced videos and all kinds of supporting staff to help you with your mental side of racing, your physical side, your bike setup, your bike maintenance. We cover it all. Get to Elevate Action Sports right now and join the community. Dunlop. There is a reason every AMA championship in the past decade was won on Dunlop tires. They are the best. Choose the best performing tire and a brand that has never wavered in their support of our sport. Choose Dunlop. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit products are designed with one goal in mind, winning. Through passion and hard work, Pro Circuit has operated the most successful 250 team in the history of the sport. They use that same formula when developing exhaust, engine, and suspension parts for every brand. When only the highest level of performance is acceptable, trust Pro Circuit. Since 2009, Seat Concepts has been dedicated to making the best aftermarket seats. More comfort, more grip, more riding. For 10 years, we've continued to raise the bar. Innovation and American craftsmanship make Seat Concepts the world leading manufacturer of power sports seats. Something from nothing. That's what Nihilo Concepts is about. It starts with a spark, an idea, a concept, which leads to a design and finishes with engineered excellence with the highest quality products created with durability in mind. All our products are made in the USA at our state-of-the-art facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you are a weekend warrior, ride for fun, or at the highest level of competition, Nihilo Concepts offers innovative titanium, aluminum, and carbon fiber parts for your dirt bike. We offer a wide variety of products that you can customize to your liking. Browse our site for foot pegs, brake tips, engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, lever grips, carbon fiber components, motor stands, our secondary on-switch, plus much much more. Head to NihiloConcepts.com and see for yourself why factory teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs Gas Gas, Orange Brigade, Club MX, KLM Gas Gas, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. Specialized Bicycles. Specialized leads the way in the world of bicycling. Whether it's cross-country racing, downhill, e-bikes, enduro, road, gravel, dual slalom, dirt jumping, or all mountain bikes that do it all, Specialized has the perfect ride for you. The brand is synonymous with engineering excellence and innovation that steers the industry. Visit your local Specialized dealer for a test ride and see just how good Specialized products are. With a rich history in motocross, ProX has been dedicated to supplying quality components since 1975. Whether you're rebuilding an engine or just need a new chain, ProX Racing Parts aims to bridge the gap between OE quality and affordability. ProX has over 9,000 part numbers and over 60 different product types that are manufactured by highly reputable or even OEM suppliers and are offered at affordable prices to help keep riders on the bike instead of in the garage. Visit ProX.com to search parts for your bike or check them out at your favorite online or local dealer. Audio the guys are just breaking in their race bikes, which will leave on the semi this Saturday to go to the first Supercross for our coast in Orlando. Uh, so the guys are just be goofing off a little bit, do some cool photos, do some cool videos. 
when you go racing, you wanna do well, but a big key is keeping the bikes on the track. That's why we chose to work with Motul. Expectations coming in as a rookie is just to try and get my feet wet and uh, honestly just send it, see where I end up and uh, do my best out there, but just ride aggressive and ride like myself in practice and uh, I should have a good time. Challenges of this sport, I believe, is just simply staying healthy. Uh, with how fast we're going um, and what we're doing, your margin for mistake is really, really small. Stay sick. If you have little rippers, then you have had to have seen Stay Sick Bikes by now. We have created bike and experiences that allow kids to develop sooner and empower them to find their own ride. From learning to ride to sharpening skills, the Stay Sick promise is accelerated growth. Whatever path your family chooses, it's going to be the ride of your life. Stay Sick Stability Cycles. I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. Hey, hey, I'm on vacation. If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it. Hey, hey, Welcome back, folks. That was your Troyly Designs timeout. If you haven't been over to TroyleyDesigns.com, go give th those guys a peek. Their brand new GP Pro line is out. We just went and uh, did a photo shoot with all this stuff with McGrath and Cole Seeley. Uh, it's very, very affordable if you're looking for a good quality good uh, value uh, but it's also super cool looking some of the designs i actually like as good as anything they do uh, super durable it's just a really good all-around line for motocross and off-road folks uh, so check out the gp pro line over there at tld also they've got their full line of mountain bike gear the paint department is up and running so you can do a full custom design 90s style uh, you can just do name and number all kinds of different options over there so Check out everything they've got to offer over at TroyleyDesigns.com. Um, Phil, let's get back into your story here. So end of 95, good solid building year for you. You've been riding the Cowies now all year. And so you're trying to put something together for 96. Like I said, you had good results, but it wasn't like so good you're going right. to get a, a deal. So you're still scrambling. Still something. scrambling, yep. So it, tell me about how the Great Western Bank thing came together. So, And did you have anything else cooking at all? No, nothing. Yeah, nobody wanted to do anything. So, you know, that was super frustrating to me. And it's like, but my results in 95 weren't the best, right? It was like, <laughs> they were okay, but there are a ton of riders yeah. that, you there's, know, are okay. Yeah, there's not, a lot of good not, riders. Not a ton. There's just a lot like of good today. riders. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I didn't get anything and I was scrambling. What am I going to do? You, you know, reached out to some teams and as everybody does that are looking for something, right? Yep. And um, nothing. So I'm like, I'll ride Cowie, Mexico again. And I was going to do that. So I had Cowies and I was like practicing and training. And a buddy of mine, Dave Castillo, um, totally into racing and he wanted to go racing. So we're like, hey, dude, let's do something here. And his dad, Jim Castillo said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll support a team. And then uh, Denny Stevenson came on board and Buddy Antonis. So we formed this team. And I forget who's, I think it was Bud Mans, Buddy Antonis is. Um, he was, I think, the guy behind the Great Western Bank. His mom, somebody His had mom a connection somebody, there. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't really a connection. It wasn't. And there was, the money never really no, became, did it? No, they did nothing. No. I, I think, right? I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't really care about that. I just wanted to go racing. Yeah. And Jim Castillo and Dave Castillo really helped me out a lot. They, they supported me. Because Jim ended up, I think, pouring a lot of money into that just to we see it through. Yeah, so, you, you know, a lot of people don't know or may know that Jim, he did well. He used to own Innovation Sports, right? He made CTI knee braces, so he did well. So that year, we flew to the races in a private jet, his private jet. Not every weekend, but a lot of the weekends we were in our, our private jet, our own team jet, yeah, going to the races, and that was super cool. Yeah, and that, and that was a good year for me too. I, I did well at some races. And that was team solid. was, I think, will always kind of go down in, History, in motocross right? folklore yep. because it was, you know, this group of guys yeah. who were um, 
Well, we had Denny Stevenson, right? Because he didn't give a crap anymore about <laughs> like trying to be cool with the factory guy so he can get a ride. He just wanted to have fun. He was at the races to have fun and and Budman, Budman did well that Budman year had too. a great yeah, year. Yeah, he did that, really good on the 125. That was the thing that was so interesting about it was you and Budman were actually putting in good results. Yeah. Yep. Dave and Denny, not so much, but they were partying and making it like seem really it, fun. It, it was fun. It was super cool. We'd be in the pits, our music would be up, we'd jump in a private jet. Fly yeah. to Laguna Seca for the F1 race. You, you, you know, we were, traveled everywhere in that jet. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun. And, you know, I was focused. I wasn't partying a whole bunch. I drank a little bit then. But, yeah, it, mm. it, was, it was a good year. I think they call that California sober. Weed, a little weed and alcohol is fine. <laughs> is, that, is that a thing? I think so. I think yeah, that's what they call well, it. I was California sober then. <laughs> um, so they, they really cool thing that year was uh, California athlete maybe yeah yeah maybe <laughs> you went to the Orlando opener and and these your bikes again no factory parts you're in fact if I remember right didn't you like your a stock cylinder or something so before that season um I knew I really liked the stock Cowie I was I rode it really well Mitch gave me pipes and you know a motor and stuff and the week before the opener, actually, I'll back up a little bit. So I was testing to get ready, get my bikes ready for the season. And um, so a friend of mine, Steve Weidler, used to own Weidler Dynamics. Mm -hmm. He done he did some uh, motors for Kawasaki back in the day. And he's a great friend of mine. So I'm like, hey, Steve, let's build me some motors. And because I want to try your motors and Mitch build me some motors. And, and we went to Castillo Ranch and tested for about a week no nah, maybe three or four days or whatever it was and um <clears throat> mitch's motor was great as usual uh steve's motor was great too you know the, i could have raced with both of those but going into the season opener for some reason i'm like i just ride this stock bike too good i feel so comfortable on it so i so the season over i, I rode a stock bike with Mitch's pipe and silencer on it. I had good suspension, right? My suspension totally stock cylinder totally bottom end, yep. everything. Like that's stock. Yep. That's crazy. Stock, yeah. And went out at the opener in Orlando and got second behind McGrath. Yep. Like solid it second. It came from behind. Yeah. I didn't oh, this, start up front. It yeah. wasn't a gimme. Nope. Came through, got second. Yep. I, I've, mm. maybe I just don't remember, but did we ride a lot together in that off season? Because I was doing all the testing for Pro Circuit. I built that whole bike around me that year. Well, do you remember when I had built that Supercross track out at... Uh, oh, uh, Competitive uh, Edge? Competitive or? Edge in Hemet. Comp Park. Yep. Comp Park. Yep. Called. Yeah, that's you right. You remember that? I was one Swappy, of the partners. Yep. Yeah. Okay. One of the partners, you gave me like a thousand bucks. Didn't we all throw in money? Yeah, yeah. So it probably Fro? cost me like seven grand to build or whatever. Fro, Rhino, Chad Pedersen, yeah. you. Yep. Emig. Yeah. So, I mean, if you each gave me a grand, that's five grand. And the guy built it for probably five. Okay. So we were riding quite a bit. That track was pretty good, too. It was good. It was gnarly. Mm. Remember that triple was like 100 feet? Yeah, there was. Some, I remember some huge. sketchy stuff on it. And um, steep. Well, but remember, I won the the Paris Invitational the weekend before the opener, and I won that. Bradshaw was there, Mike Craig. That's right, and I almost I got second. Yeah. If you remember, I Wyndham and I Wyndham smashed won, into huh? each other. Yep, and I flattened. Wyndham my won the one twenty fives. I won the two fifties. Yeah, I was leading it halfway. Remember, they did a halfway yep. pit stop. Yeah, and I was leading it halfway, and then he. Dove inside and blocked past me. Right off the right start. Right off the start. And I smashed into oh. him before that step up and it flattened my pipe. I knocked him off the track. Oh, but... and you still got second? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know that big step up and then we go yeah, left and there yeah. was that big double? I big, could barely yeah. clear the double after oh. he smashed my pipe. Yeah. I had yeah. no power. So that's right. We were so we were riding a lot. I yeah, just we forgot were. about that. Uh, Did you ever go track. to Castillo Ranch with me? Yeah. Yep. We went up there a couple of times that year too. Hmm. Oh, we were both like riding yeah. well that year. We were awesome. And I broke my femur. Oof. I don't know how to do Dude, I remember that. Well, I was living. That was with bad. You guys still. Yeah. Or you had just moved out and bought the house mm -hmm. across the street then, huh? Yep. Yeah. 
So take me through that season. Um, obviously at the opener, what, what you get second behind Jeremy at the opener. What do you think? So, you know, one thing I remember about that day is like, <clears throat> you know, one of my issues uh, along with many, right? So, and when I say that, we're, we're talking about elite level athlete, right? You're talking about the best in the world yeah. in what you do. So for me, when I say like, oh, I was this, probably to a normal athlete, it's not that big of a deal. But when you're trying to be the best of the best, elite, it makes a difference. Everything you do makes yeah. a difference. It's a game and of I, inches, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So in that, I always say the funnest times of my racing is like, right when I turned pro or coming up through the amateurs and, you know, you make big gains, right? Yeah. And you're like, oh, I can't believe I beat that guy. But when you're like racing for top five in it, whatever sport it is, when you're competing for top five in the world, it's not by that much. It's mm. by inches, right? So what were we saying? <laughs> <laughs> I just said, what were you thinking after that oh, second yeah. at the opener? So one thing that stands out to me about that day is like, you know, yeah, like I said, I'll back up. One of my issues was like, I used to always look at everybody. I would let everybody influence me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Dude? You yeah. know, I would line up. Oh, my gosh, there's Bradshaw. He's next to me. Or, oh, my gosh, look at his bike. Oh, that's really good. It has to work good. I would always let it play with me. And then um, I remember Orlando. I remember going into that day. I remember I just won Paris, the Invitational against some good guys. And I remember going into that day. I'm here to race how I'm going to race. I'm not going to think about anybody. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and I actually did it. And I got second. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, that was awesome. But then again, if you look at an interview with me on the podium... I'm not going to let people push me around anymore. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, dude, shut up, be stoked, put your head down and work and work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, dude, you should be stoked. They're, they're proud. You got second one time. It's like, yeah. chill out. And it just doesn't come off right. Right. Like, it's like uh, somebody going on the podium. One of our current racers went, yeah, I just want to thank myself, you know, for never giving up on me. I put in the work. <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, just be quiet. Just you're up. showing what yeah. an idiot yeah, you are. Yeah, you're just showing what an idiot you are. That's it. <laughs> right? So, but I did well that year. I did well a lot of races. And then I think the next, so the next weekend to me was more impressive. At Anaheim? Uh, uh, I think it was Indianapolis. Oh, Okay. What does it show? I got like well, a fourth or a fifth or something. It went Anaheim, Seattle, San Diego, Atlanta. I mean, Indy no. weighs in. What did I get at Indy? Seventh. But you were sixth at Dallas, fifth at St. Louis. Yeah. I, uh, so it was one of those that like I came from the back, like way back. Denver fourth. And um, I remember I had passed LaRocco. He ended up getting third in that main event, but I passed him and I think Rhino was next and it was like two laps to go and I was going by Rhino and we hit and went off the track. Mm. So my result wasn't good, but I was riding really well. I was riding good. I and mean, that, and after that is when, I forget his name, Roy, no, he was the team manager for Cowie. Uh, well, it was Roy Turner and then Schoenstrom. Maybe Turner. Okay. After that, I said, hey, dude, I, you guys give me a motor. I got a stock bike here. And I was ripping. I was doing good. I was fast. Yeah. Um, and it took him till Denver to give me a motor all season. So and Denver, Denver was Denver, the first race yep, with it, and you got yep, a fourth. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Dude, you, yeah. I mean, especially considering you're on a, a stock bike, you were in the top, you were six, seven, seven, six, seven, eight, six. Five, six, yeah. you're all up front. Yeah. And then even outdoors, I, I don't, I was hurt all summer, so I wasn't there. I guess I just didn't pay attention. But man, you were third at Mill Millville. Like third at Millville. Yeah, that was a good day. Yeah. Uh, mm. Lots of top tens. You had some, you had some rough, rough rounds here too. Six yeah. at Washougal, uh, you know, eighth at Southwick. You had good rides, man. Oh, I remember Southwick. I think I got like a, it was crazy. I got like a six six for eighth. Mm. 
And me and Henry, Doug Henry, his hometown, battled the second moto like the last half of the whole second moto. Yeah. If I would have got by him, I would have got third overall. But I didn't. So I got eighth overall. <laughs> so it was crazy. I'm like, dude, I didn't even get an eighth. I got six six or yeah. Or I don't know. There was a six five or something. That's just a deep field, yeah, right? Deep, There's just a lot deep. of good guys. Yeah, Doug Henry's in there too, right? He wasn't slow. He was he was good. So at the end of that year, um, were you feeling like you had to be at this point? Ninety five was a building year. Now you're getting podiums indoors and out. One, I can't believe you weren't getting hit up by more teams. So Keith McCarty at Yamaha called me. And he just kind of said, hey, what are you thinking? What are you going to do next year? To me, I was stoked. And um, somebody from Honda talked to me a little bit. And I was, you know, super pumped. But they didn't really follow through. But that's when I started partying a little bit. Mm. So maybe they heard through the grapevine. I'm not sure. But a little bit. I still wasn't, like, off the hook like I got. But I was starting to Mm. have... Fun, more fun than I should have. Um, well, and <clears throat> and talk a little bit about that the the sort yeah, of the man. party culture that was really prevalent in the '90s. You know, like I've said, we were probably not as structured as we should have been, um, and I think it swung too far the other way. But man, everybody was partying then, and I, I we'll get to this in '97. I hadn't <laughs> drank till '97. And that's what I yeah, know. That's I, I, I was I was with Ping <laughs> the very first night he had alcohol. <laughs> we'll, we'll it tell was hilarious. Story. Yeah, you love to tell people this uh, story. It was great. But, <laughs> you remember the bet we made? Because I lost a bet. That's why I had to drink. Oh, oh. <laughs> because going into '97, I was all gung ho. I was going to be the you know best little oh, racer I could be. You, if you didn't, like... I had to be on the podium at the Nationals before the trip to Havasu, which yeah. was, what, May, Labor Dude, Day? that's a great, great or, or, goal uh, for Memorial. you, right? I mean, that's... Well, that's I cool. wasn't. I wasn't on the podium. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's a good... <laughs> and the fact that you took the bet, all right, yeah, I'll take that bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What a dick. <laughs> Anyway, oh, I bet you won't be for sure. <laughs> uh, well, we'll talk about it, but talk about um, what happened in 97. You ended up at Chaparral, but what happened? Yamaha just. So, yeah, I don't know. They It just never materialized. So I don't know what happened. So my next best thing was Chaparral. Chaparral wanted to do a team. They would have already been doing a team the previous couple of years. Yeah. <clears throat> right? Yeah. So. And then they wanted to do a bigger team. It was Jimmy Button, myself. Was Brooks managing? Yep. Okay. Larry Brooks. Um, yeah, it was Brandis. No, it, it was a good team. It was a good team, but... Schnell? There was like yep. eight of you guys. Yeah, it was crazy. there was a lot. You, Button, <clears throat> uh, Schnell, Brandis. Brandis, yep. Pedersen. Is that yep. right? Uh, Travis Preston. Travis Preston. Yep. He was on that team. Tall, you guys yeah. ate a lot of tall. Yeah, a lot of height. You guys could have been a basketball. Team. My my bike wasn't good that year. It wasn't. The, the team was good. They had great support, but for some reason, I couldn't get my bike to run well. And you were on a Yamaha, right? Yamaha. Yep. But the team was mixed up. Like, weren't no? The, it was all Yamaha. It was all Yamaha. Because yep. at some point they switched, and some guys were on different brands. No, it was all Yamaha when I rode there. Okay, I believe so. It must have been the year prior. Yeah. Because I think Deegan was on like a Suzuki yep. at some point, yeah. but riding for them. Anyway, okay. Yeah. So you just, who was doing them? Um, well, I In-house. think Dave Dameron from Chaparral. What a great guy. You know, he he really, he helped a lot. And he's always been super cool to me. What a great guy. Chaparral's awesome. <laughs> um, he wanted to try to hit, to build motors, yep. in-house motors. And that was the year he was trying to do it. Which makes sense, right? If yeah, you're a dealership, it was sure. actually brilliant on his yep, part. He's a great businessman for sure. Wasn't Varner doing the, the not, engine work though? Uh, or who was doing not it? Not yet. No, he had a guy doing the motors. Okay. That he maybe came from road racing. I'm not sure okay. where Dave thought that the guy would be a good fit, but um, I couldn't get it to run. I think Button did well, mm. right? So why can how can he do well on 
and I couldn't. You, you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I just, Dean yeah. was my mechanic. Dean was actually afraid to rev my bike on the line. It was that bad. Oh, really? Bo, 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 bo. It was like bog and it was bad. Yeah. That was, and then how are you going to compete with the best guys when you're thinking, oh, my bike sucks. It's like, yeah. it won't even run right. I always thought there was kind of three things you had to have dialed. You had to be confident in your bike. You had to be confident in your fitness and you had to be confident in your riding. Like I was always Jeez, trying yeah. to get those three legs to mm. stand up. Right. And if one is off for me, I, I was a mess, you know, and you obviously, well, how do you go to line? Like it, it, it even proves that the year before you're on a stock motor, but it probably ran clean. Well, yeah, but so I, I would even add to that. I would say if you bring it down, break it down to two, would be your confidence and your ability to ride the bike. Because one year in Geneva, Switzerland, I think it was Geneva, like I had a stock Cowie. I think it was in 96, going into 97 year. Okay. My bike would, I would go off the finish line jump and my brother was my mechanic. I think he was. Yeah. So, and it would just, I would land and bowl and my bike would bog and I would, we, I would laugh with my brother. Yeah, that bike's not that good. And I mean, it was okay. It just wasn't perfect. So I wasn't confident in the bike, but I remember qualifying. I qualified second and maybe got a second or something in the main. And then the next, Jeremy was there too. And then the next day I qualified first, I beat Jeremy in qualifying on that bike. And then in the main event, Steve Lampson knocked me down and I had to come from back and I think I got like a fourth. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a great weekend for me. Hmm. I wasn't confident in the bike, right? But I was confident in my riding and my ability to do it. So, well, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. The two strokes, I, I just always remember if the jetting, if it ran clean, it mm -hmm. could be not even that yeah. as fast, but mm -hmm. I was better off. It, it could be a missile with a little fart or hiccup, and I'm in my head. Is it going to do yeah. it right here? Is it going to yeah. do it right here? Yeah. Made jetting really important. Oof. So how was that yeah. uh, 97 season then? You didn't like your bike. That's not a great... No, I'm sure my results were not that good not at great. all. 18th at the opener, followed by an 18th <laughs> in Seattle. Ser yeah, see, there 17, you go. 17, 18... 13. Serious? Got a 10th at Mini, and then 9, 8, 9, 10. Eighth at Buds. A lot, of, a lot of like 10ths. That's you awful. Know. Not a great season for you, though. No. So, was, so that's when I started partying. Because you were just like, forget it. I was it. just like bummed. Mm. Yep. And mm. who were you hanging out with? Like, Because you and Fro were buddies. Yeah, so me and Fro were buddies. We used to go party a lot and this was together. his heyday where this he was, was his heyday he winning. was actually winning yeah well besides jeremy him and jeremy yeah but fro won 97 he Super won both Cross. titles yeah yep and he was partying too he so, had his bus and yep bus and i was doing it with him but it wasn't helping me <laughs> right so my i think my biggest issue is when i started going to huntington beach so like we would go once in a while, we would go to a place called Club Rubber. <clears throat> you I knew where you going with. I never went, but like. Yeah, so I found some buddies and stuff in, um, in Huntington Beach that were partiers down there. And uh, they knew the clubs, they knew everything. So I would go hang out with them. Not moto guys, just Huntington Beach. Not moto Beach. guys, okay. yeah. And that's when it went south, pretty bad. I mean, not really bad. I mean, I didn't get strung out on heroin or coke or. Yeah. You know, meth or anything like that. Just but, weed and but, pills and booze kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. But you guys went... Weed, pills, booze. Yeah, no big deal. Well, I mean... It, it made me make a lot... The pills were like... It wasn't like prescription pills or anything like that. It was like ecstasy. Yeah. You know, that was a big thing down there. And I didn't do it a ton, but I did it. And it was not good. It made me uh, definitely make some real horrible decisions yeah like really bad i'll i'll tell you a couple that we're just like i'm humiliated about really you know, so yeah, I, don't, I didn't real bad i didn't you know so you can tell the havasu story with me but like mm. that was the first time i drank and i didn't i didn't really even drink much even after that i didn't yeah 
Yeah, you never were. You never. I never were, really got into the yeah, party. You never much. got into it that much. So which when you, I'm thankful for you. So good. when you guys would go do that, I would hear the stories, but yeah. I never. And you're like, oh my gosh. I just I didn't know, you know. I just was kind of. Yeah, and then I started going to Hollywood, you know, hanging out with my friend Justin. Super Justy. Yep, he introduced me to like the whole scene, like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. We'd go hang out with him and. Because his Justin's wife mm. or was married to uh, uh, an actress at the time, right? What was her name? Uh, Nicole Eggert. Nicole Eggert. Justin was married to Nicole yeah. Eggert. Yeah. And she was... was but she he, a, Justin grew up with DiCaprio. Mm. And he would like... That was his friend for a long time and knew him well. And we would go hang out and just not a good scene. Yeah. Especially when, when you're trying to be an athlete racing dirt bikes. Yeah. What are you thinking? Does it, and it almost, be, did you get done with those weekends and feel kind of like guilty about it? Like it would no, beat not, your confidence no, up? No, not then. No, you just didn't care. No, I just didn't care. Yeah. Hmm. No, because, no, I didn't care, but it, it affects you. Absolutely. You can't hmm. do that. And, yeah. Yeah. What was the gnarliest hmm. weekend you had down there? And what, and explain to people what Club what, Rubber what, was. What, what, what. <laughs> Cause so, I never went, but the stuff I no, heard. No, well, you kind of did. You, I never went you, to rubber. I okay, would go the to the crusty, boogie. Cus, crusty Demons Dirt videos. I did go to that launch. Yeah. Is so, that it? Was that the place? So that's the Galaxy Theater. That's mm. where they had Club Rubber. But it and was Club like. Club Rubber was just an off weekend of, you, you know, it was pretty much the same thing as a Crusty Demons of Dirt movie premiere. Okay. Pretty much the same thing. Just not with a whole bunch of dirt bike guys. Huh. Just with party guys. Yeah. But it was the same thing. Chicks. And this was back yeah, in the day. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, and maybe you can tell a good pimp and hoe started. This is when pimp and hoe parties were everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you were. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, I don't even. Can you imagine so that? So being now? young and like thinking you could do whatever you want. Yeah, you could do whatever you want. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was crazy, crazy. But guys would literally mm. dress up in like fur coats and. Yep. Uh, Crusty Demons of Dirt. Just watch those. Yeah. There's pimp and hoe parties on there. Yeah. And, and the girls would be in lingerie it. or yeah. less. Or less. Yep. And then so those parties were basically people dressed like that and then drugs and yep. whatever. Yep. <sighs> Good times. <laughs> you know, I like. I, <laughs> I, I've asked people, you know, do you regret all that stuff? And it's like, it kind of turned you into who you are. So, yeah. So I think about that and, and I think that, yeah, it, you could say it was fun. Absolutely. You could say it was fun, but it still affects who you are, right? It makes you into who you are as well. Yeah. But you still have those thoughts and like, it, it definitely affects you. Like my wife is incredible. Right. So it honestly affects the way you look at women, right? Mm -hmm. All the things that you've done and said to girls throughout your past. And, you know, you look at them in a certain way and you're trying to get something out of them. And that just becomes how you're you trying think to get about something them. in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what you're trying to say. Oh, there you go. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> So, but it affects you, right? It yeah. affects the way you look at them now, too. Yeah. So, you know, you think, oh, do you wish you wouldn't have done that stuff? Well, I am who I am because I you did that. And I know what I know. And I know how to raise my boys and what to say to them, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so that part's good, right? Because you have wisdom and you know exactly what it's about and what how to steer your kids away from it. Yeah. Because I would never want them to have the baggage that I have, mm. because it does affect me. I'm getting better, right? My not my mind's getting renewed, and you know, as much as I'm away from it, but it definitely affects you. Sure. And not everybody pulls out of it either. There's yeah. people that are still on that tour. I know that can't pull out of it in their 40s and, and 50s. And yeah, and it's like, dude, you're gonna end up homeless. Like with no teeth or not healthy or not have a beautiful family. I got a family right now that I'm so blessed with that I can't believe that, you know, I was able to pull out of it and do something good with it. Yeah. Mm. Well, 
That was a wild time, man. And like, like I said, yeah. I know a lot of people like to hear those stories and it's probably conflicting a little bit for you because you kind of feel like, man, I, that was what an idiot I was. But at the same time, at the time, it's pretty fun. <laughs> so you kind of go, ah, I shouldn't have done it. Yeah, so, so I could touch on that. So I'm also trying to be an athlete at this time, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was fun in the moment when you're doing it. But as soon as you're done, it's like you're getting torn apart. I have this side of me that's like, you, dude, you got to like get serious and you, you're going to have nothing really soon because you're not going to be able to compete with these guys. Mm. But then it's like, oh man, that's like, that was fun. I'm going to do it again. Yeah. You know, so you're actually tormenting yourself really, mm. you know? So, and then I look back, it's like, would I do it again? If I had the opportunity, you, you know what I'm saying? Would I go down the same road? I for sure I wouldn't go down the same road. But, but you think about it. <laughs> but I do have the wisdom now and yeah. I do know yeah. what it's about. Nobody can tell me what living like a rock star's life. We used to fly around our own jet. We used to party like that. You'd be around. People wanted to be your friend, right? Yeah. Like rock stars, they want to be your friend because you have the party. We had the party. Mm -hmm. We went and did whatever we wanted to do. You know, so, and that's one really good thing that I've gained from it is knowing that I don't want that. Mm. That's never a desire of mine anymore. Yeah. Because, you know, you look from the outside and you're like, man, that, that would be cool. That would be awesome to be a rock star like that. Metallic or, or not Metallica, Motley Crue. Look at, you know, yeah. the, they're all drug addicts. They're all like, ask them now how, you know, it was probably fun, but they're like, no, it was, it was yeah. not fulfilling. You continued wanted to do it. It, you only wanted more. It was never, there was no contentment. It was like, yeah, it was always a well, strive to party. And if they're still you know, alive, you could ask them yeah, right, or right. you could just look at them. They look 20 years older yeah. than they are. Right. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, there was something while we're just on this topic that I always thought was interesting. And I, I admired you for this just cause it was so different than like, mm. <laughs> than my approach. You always called me the weasel, right? Like I was always trying to angle something. Weasel your way in. But you mm. had this approach with girls, but with anybody, like you're kind of this way, mm. just in all things, brutal honesty. Like when you were going, I remember you, we'd be out somewhere and you'd see a girl and you'd just be like, Hey, I want to okay. take you home. Let's go home. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to have sex with you and then I probably won't call you. I mean, you'd be like that honest. with Yeah, them. that's awful. And they'd be like, all right, yeah, let's go. I mean, you would make it work. And I'd be like, how is he he's saying this crazy stuff? I'm over here, baby. I love you. We could be together forever, you know, but you're playing. I'm over there trying to wine them and dine them and love them. And you're, you're just like. I'm not looking for a girlfriend, but if a you punk, want a good time. A punk, right? I was just, it always, I don't know if it impressed me, but I was like, wow, <laughs> how does he do that? It's just being a punk, right? Well, it's just like a, a, a cocky punk that's super insecure. That's not a good combination. Yeah, I suppose. But, but mentally, it's not a good combination. But I would say now, you still are honest. You'll tell somebody, even if it hurts their feelings, um, not to be mean, but you're just, you don't try well, to like, sugar coat oh, or okay so know. i listen to this guy that talks about men being men right and i think this culture has softened guys up so much that it's just there's no real strong solid foundation i mean there are right? amen very few there there are but it's getting bad you, you know what i'm saying and and i think if you if if you're reasonable if you can listen, there's no reason you shouldn't have a conversation with somebody. Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. and you should be, I should be able to tell you my view or at least have some background that supports my view. And, and if I'm get, if it's my view, I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. Right. And if I don't, if I'm just asking a question, I should say, man, this is a question I have. But I don't think that you should shy away from conversations with people. And you don't. Mm. And I just, well, I, I, I do, I do admire that. Even another thing too, 
something about you that people maybe not know. I've never, well, now I know maybe a couple other guys, but I've very few people I've ever met. You can sit down on a plane in the middle seat. And by the time you land, you're going golfing with this guy. This guy's coming out to your house and you're, he's going to stay with you for a week. Like you make friends anywhere. I'm not like that. I'm a very, yeah. like you put me in a crowd. I kind of just, I'm not really interested. I like small groups of people. Um, and I don't, I'm very selective about who's my friend and who I like kind of let in where you, man, you're just friends with anybody. And I, I admire it because it's, I know I could take you to a party or, or a gathering where you don't know anybody. You're friends with everybody by the time yeah. the night's over. Kevin yeah. Carmen, you know, like he's yeah. that way. I, I'm actually, I really admire people like that. So I think everybody has a gift. Everybody's gifted with something completely different, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're great off the cuff talking. You really do a good job. I mean, I'm impressed with that. So, but one of the things with, you know, being friends with everybody and be able to talk to everybody. When I was racing, I wanted to be friends with everybody. You mm. know what I'm saying? That really hurt me. Oh, because, that, they, that they weren't? Yeah, no, no, not that they weren't because they were. I was friends with Wyndham, oh, I see Jeremy. Made it hard to race them. Those are all just my great friends. I'm yeah. talking to them before the start. It's like... I don't really think that you want to be friends with everybody on the line. It's like, dude, you want to kill these guys. Yeah. Right? You were the opposite of Hannah and I, I'm, <laughs> Or Jeremy or Emig yeah. or Stuart or Carmichael. Mm. Right? I was the opposite of those guys. Those guys were there to do a job. Jeremy, he, he, was, he was a great friend of mine, right? But when he was at the races, he was focused and ready to do what he wanted to do. I just wanted to be friends, mm. you know? Hmm. So I, th I think that like, it's a gift to, you know, be able to communicate and be friends with people. And I think it's good, but there are different circumstances where it doesn't really help. Yeah, sure. I, I get that. You, yeah. You, when that gate drops, you have to not, I've experienced this where I'm trying to pass a guy who I like, who's my friend, and I'll have an opening. I'm like, ah, uh, ah, uh, you sure? Yeah, I don't want to hit him. Remember Mexico? When, <laughs> what? We were racing and we were like, bah, ran it into each other. I think you were living with me or something. <laughs> I don't remember that, really. You don't? You no. came up to me after the race and said, why did you do that? Kyle Lewis won. I got <laughs> second. I and I had to hit you to get by you. I think I do remember that. <laughs> It was Monarch. Was I mad? You were totally mad at me. <laughs> Why did you do that? I can't believe you like run into me. You didn't have to do that. I'm like, dude, I'm like racing to win this championship. Oh, God. I was such a little bitch. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I vaguely do remember that now. That's funny. Um, tell me about your favorite numbers. This is, uh, you remember Dano Legia, right? Yep. Dano, if you're out there listening, I know he's a fan of the show. And so he's always sending me, hey, <coughs> you should ask guys well, like, what their favorite numbers were and what numbers they were each season. And uh, you had a lot of good national numbers. Um, but 13 for me, like if I think of Phil Lawrence, 13 stands out. Yeah. Because you picked 13. Yep. yep. Um, and what were you on mm -hmm. Suzuki? Um, 31. 31. Yeah. And maybe it's because the the number, you know, 13 and 31. But like what, what was your favorite number and why... Why did you pick 13? Uh, well, I think 13 for sure is my favorite number. I still use it to this day on like everything that I have to put a number on. Okay. I'll use number 13. So, you know, his and pin for anything is probably 13. Yeah, my pin, you just put me <laughs> and then 13 and you got it. Factory 13, 13. <laughs> oh, dude. I just got into your bank account. Um, so, so the AMA, how they used to do it, they still may do it. So whatever you're ranked for that year in position, that's what national number you got for the next year. So mine fell on 13. But most people wouldn't take it. But AMA has a rule because it's an unlucky number. People are uh, uh, people don't like number 13. Superstitious. Superstitious, yeah. yeah. So they let you pick number 14 like Wyndham did. That's how he got number oh, 14. Oh, he was supposed to be 13? Yeah. Uh. And he even called me, hey, what about number 13? Because I was already 13. <laughs> um, and Swinkster took it too. Swinkster took it too, yep. 
So A May said, Hey, what's what's up? Do you want to pick number 14? And for me, it's like, no, I believe in God. I don't believe in I'm not superstitious. I'm gonna like, no, it's like number 13. I want number 13. I want to prove to everybody that it's not like superstitious yeah. or anything. Yeah. And I remember at the beginning of the season, I the guy who was painting my helmets. I had him put a horseshoe, a clover leaf, <laughs> and then a 13 right over it. You know, just kind of yeah. mock the like, and 13 was a good number for me. Yeah. Yeah, I did you well. Had a, you had a great season that year. Yeah. Just the one year you had it, right? 13? Just the one year, yeah. So but I always pick number like I think 13. Stingray took 13 once, yep. didn't he? Yeah. Um, RJ did, but he RJ broke did. his wrist. That was the year he broke his wrist? Or was it the year after? Uh, maybe a year after. I think it was the year after yeah. he took it. Mm. Very but few I, guys, I though. I did well with it, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Wyndham so, was scared. So he he got 13 and didn't... I wonder who else. Number I have to go 14. back and look well, through the 14s. number 14? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you want to tell my Havasu story since we're on 97? <laughs> <clears throat> we made the bet. We I made lost. the bet. You lost. He had to drink. So... <clears throat> what was it? Kokomo. Kokomo's? Kokomo's. London Bridge Resort, right? <laughs> This is the big club. So Ping has always been like this little boy to me, right? Coming from Arizona, mama's boy. Always like a little weasel. Hey, what's up? Trying to weasel his way in. So he loses this bet. He has to drink with us. Was it Goldschlager shots? That was the Emig's thing, right? That was he Emig's would just deal. Line, he would give him a hundred bucks and line up all these Goldschlager shots. We just drink that? cranberry vodka because I'm like, I don't like the way alcohol it smells. Oh, and yeah. Tastes. Well, whatever. He had a like a. I had a Shirley vodka cranberry. Temple. That's what I had. He had like a Shirley Temple or something. <laughs> he had like a half of vodka cranberry. And I remember I'm, you know, we're drinking and Ping, <laughs> Ping runs up to me. Oh, all <laughs> bouncing around, all like glazed and all happy. Why do I feel so dizzy? I, I'm dizzy. Yeah. Runs back out on the dance floor, jumping around. And we're just like, oh my gosh. And that was it. You liked the feeling of being dizzy. He loved to tell that story. He loves to tell it. He tells Why do I feel so dizzy? This is great. Back out on the dance floor dancing. It was a good time. It I was, yeah. You were, you were having a great time. Uh, all right. That was funny. That was funny. That was like a whole different world to me. That was the first time I'd been to Havasu. What did you think about it? Were you like, this is too crazy? I felt way like... out, I felt way out of my element. Did you really? Oh, yeah. Like, that was fun, right? That night, because it was everybody I knew. And, you know, of course, you have a drink. You feel like, who cares? You know, I mean, yeah, you're just right, chilling. Right. But, like, I remember there was a big houseboat with a stripper pole on it. And Jamie Foxx, the actor... Do you remember that? He was out there and he had all these strippers on his boat dancing on this pole. And I was just like, that's a trip. And then guys were going across the channel and smoking weed. And I'm like, whoa, man, I just felt it was just way out of my element. I don't know. You, Everyone else seemed like they were just that was normal for them. And it I was felt normal. Like, yeah, it wasn't normal yeah. for me. So I was yeah. standing in the back just kind of going, wow. <laughs> 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 seeing the guy that just won both motos at the national yeah and and so i was kind of going wow i guess this is the thing yeah this is right what you do yeah. and that was that's what made me that's what the 90s like, were yeah it was a party and i'm yeah. like well if jeremy's over there doing beer bongs and there's fro like smoking a bowl and they're one and two <laughs> i mean well, there's everybody you know yeah yeah yeah. Rhino and you and but you know, I just wonder everybody. what LaRocco and like Kadrowski used to think. It's like, dude, these guys are just like partying like crazy and working us. Yeah, they had it had to be frustrating. Yeah. Um, or maybe they didn't think about it. I don't know. Oh, they thought about it. <laughs> I'm sure they thought about it. Okay, so going to ninety eight. Um you get done with Chaparral. You didn't like that bike. Yeah. So were you, you kind of knew. I knew I was done. Here. Yep. And then I had nothing. I don't know. Well, even what I did in 98. Well, you were on a Cowie. I thought it was maybe Moto Triple X or something. No, that was not on a Cowie. Suzuki hmm. maybe. Well, the results showed you on a Cowie in 98. So I don't know really? what you're riding. Yeah. 
and you had some you had some again some decent rides like it wasn't amazing but it's like top tens in supercross seventh at bud's creek um seventh at, at binghamton so that's it so i i can tell you at the end of 97 it's all a blur that's when i was partying the most uh, yeah. i was going to australia Oh, that's right. Like you were for doing Australia, four so. or five seasons to do their Supercross series, and that were, was a full party. Were you kind of mm. like not giving up here, but just kind of like whatever, dude? I'm I was gonna, whatever, dude. Yeah, I was just going off talent. That's it. Mm. I wasn't training. I was just partying. Mm. I was and, riding still. Yeah, I was riding, but. Mm. When you say partying, was it with like these Huntington Beach people? Was uh, it like Huntington who you hang- Beach people? Yeah. yeah, pretty much. I mean, Fro, you know, Fro, Fro was on the program. To, yeah, he was on the program. Um, so that year, you don't even <laughs> you don't even remember. I don't Roto. remember. No, that's crazy. So crazy. Like, what did I do? Who did I ride for? I don't know. I thought I can't the results remember. said Cowie. Maybe Mobile Moto Tri- Moto Triple X, or was that like? 99. Well, I was going to ask you. <laughs> it's your story. I can only get so much know. off the internet. <laughs> so I don't know what years it was, but Fro had a team. Strategic oh. 3, like, what yeah. was it called? The Edge. The Edge Motorsports. Yeah. I rode for that for a little bit. Moto Triple X one year. <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. So that 98, 99... Those were your last. You did a couple races in 2000, but 98, yeah, 99. Yeah. Uh, and I have you in 99 on a Suzuki, so that would have been triple X? Yep. Okay. How was that? Would you remember anything from that? Horrible. Yeah. Kenny Watson was super cool. He was my mechanic. He, um, good friend of mine, he tried. Well, I don't know how hard he tried. We had fun. <laughs> <laughs> he tried. Well, I don't know if he tried. Well, <laughs> Well, dude, he took me to the races. You know what I'm saying? He was Kenny Watson was always super cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was always he was he was a good dude. That's a great group. Like Jordan Burns is awesome. Yeah, and, yeah. They they all were. Eric awesome. Sandin from No Effects. Yep, yep. Great, great. They, people. they were all super cool. But, but they, you know, I wasn't in a, any place to be an athlete. Yeah, it's just like I was partying and. Well, that ninety doing my best to have fun. The yeah. ninety nine year, you you didn't have one top ten serious yeah and you only raced till you just did supercross only that's awful you got 11th at san diego and then um 2000 you did just th- two you did one supercross and three nationals on a yamaha yep what that was, was that? uh with the edge strategic oh, oh, oh okay yep that and that's sense. it that's that's my moto career yeah so, um, anything stand out from those last two years, or you were just partying? Like just was, partying. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever have any? Did you ever get arrested or have any sketchy moments? Nope, never. Nothing. Nope. What about rental cars? Do you remember? So I did. Yeah, I do. You know, there's a couple of things in there that, man, I don't even want to tell you. It's like so humiliating, right? So being so U.S. Open in Las Vegas. So I was. You know, on the party train, like I wanted to party. So you'd go to US Open. You're one of the invited riders, right? And that was an honor to, you know, be invited. And you just like, you know, my back was hurting a little bit. And I just remember, oh, I want to party. So, hey, I, I'm not racing. You know, you're all set up. You got your bike set up, your team's there. And it's like, you just say that you're hurt so you can start partying. Mm. Yeah, and you start drinking Jack and Cokes and smoking weed and Man. not good. So dumb, dude. It's like, yeah. what a waste. But that's what it was. That's where that road leads you. Yep. Yep. Mm. I remember, um, I who was with us is, is I, it's blurry, but 94, one of the first nationals I did was Red Bud with, with Randy. We drove back there and... We went out in this rental car. It was in Buchanan is where we went and found this old Walmart that had a parking lot and then a ramp up to an upper lot. Yeah. Were you with us? I think Button was with us. I thought it was me, Didn't you, Button. Button ruin his car? It was Rhino. Or it was oh, Button's yeah, car. Yeah. Rhino was driving. And I said, dude, let me out. I don't want to be in this car when you're driving it. Rhino scared yeah. me even way yeah. back then. Rhino scared me. 
And I remember standing behind the wall as he was coming up wide open and just dukes a hazard this car. Yeah. Again, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I, I, I was a little preppy kid from Scottsdale. Yeah. I, I, this was blowing my mind. And I, I just, you know, dung, dung, dung. <laughs> and then the oil pan blows I, out. I think that was Rhino driving Button's car. I think it was. But you were with us, right? Uh, I, I don't think I was oh. with you. I was with you that weekend. Okay. But dude, check this out. Button, I think we're leaving Southwick and I'm bumping him in a rental car, bumping the back of his car. He pulls his emergency brake <laughs> and hits back, oh, like like the e-brake, which lifts his car up and gasses it and drops his car right on the hood of mine and then gasses it. My whole front end was ripped. Like I'm just like, dude, he just ruined my rental car. I'm just like, he's still laughing about it. I was like. I remember all the time we would like, we would take each other's antennas and bend them down and let them snap back and dent the car. We'd be in a drive through or something yeah. and bumping each other while you're trying to pay. And then the tellers would be like, oh, you just got hit. And he'd be like, oh, no, no, it's fine. Don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It, intersections. I remember people pushing each other out into intersections. Does people do that anymore? Or are we just idiots? Well, they, they, I don't think they hang out. We were idiots. Yes. Yes. Okay. We were idiots. All right. Okay. But I don't think they hang out like that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Well, in the old right? the old days, especially nationals, you you had practice on Friday, so all day Saturday nothing, and what you, you race Sunday. Remember, we go play basketball, we go to the mall, we play golf. Dude, check this. But we out. all hung out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jeremy Albrecht, we I think it was Hangtown, so it was Saturday like practice day. We were at this go kart track. What year is this? Right? Ish. Mm, I don't know. Okay. 89 oh okay yeah no no it was like i don't early I don't 90s know. early 90s okay. yeah so jeremy albrick we rent these cars we're gonna go drive these cars and they're smashing them and the guy comes out he's like hey you can't do that jeremy albrick it's you know you got a track and it's all gated breaks out through the gate takes the rent a car or the no, not rent go a car. Kart. The go kart out into the parking lot. <laughs> oh, he's all shredded. And the guy's like calling the cops and like screaming. It's like just crazy stuff. Nonstop. It was kind of like <clears throat> who could do the craziest thing? Yeah. Who's going to do the craziest thing? All trying to impress all one another. All to try to huh? impress yeah. one another. Who's going to do the craziest thing? Do you know why that doesn't happen anymore? I think social media. Yeah. We could do it, and no, we were the only ones that knew. Even if you yeah. got arrested, which I got arrested yeah. for messing around in a rental car. You once. did? Yeah, I mean, we got let off, but I got put in a car. Um, I don't think I've ever been put in a car. Uh, maybe. Yeah, it was a it was a weird deal. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, if that happened now, I mean, everybody everyone's recording everything, right? Yeah. Back then, mm -hmm. no one knew. You could keep stuff kind of a secret. Right, I'm. I'm very thankful that I <laughs> there were no social media around because those thankful. club rubber days would still be going around. Those videos. yeah, jeez, I would not want my boys to. You'd have a hundred million views on YouTube. <laughs> so all right, um, after '99, you did those couple of races for Fro in 2000. Did you? Were you just like, this is it? Like I'm done. Yeah. So actually, when I rode for Fro, I think at the end of the season. <clears throat> I knew that my career was done. I knew that. But I think the very last year I tried to ride, actually, actually let me back up. <clears throat> the year I rode for Fro, I said, this is my last chance. And I knew it was. So I was trying to clean up. And, and I did, I did. I, I, I stopped pretty much, not totally. And I was focused. I was riding well. I actually was riding well. And um, I just had a lot of struggles in my life. I was trying to, like, you know, clean things up. <clears throat> and um, I think I just... And then that's when I started getting hurt. Mm -hmm. I started, like, blowing apart my shoulder, messing my knee up. And it was just over and over and over. And that helped me, like, push me down in a hole. Mm. So, injuries are injuries tough. are brutal yeah watch a yep. kid like austin mm. forkner that just keeps having big one after big one after big one and you just go dude my heart breaks for him because i'm like ah, i've been there that is hard 
Mentally, um, that is so hard. Mentally, yeah. Yeah, it's like, mm. I mean. So did you get to a place where you were like, I'm done, 100% I'm done? I did. So I did. So I've always known about Christianity and I've always, you know, I used to run a cross on my chest protector, but it was really for good luck, right? Mm. And obviously, I wasn't following or doing anything with it. I was partying. I was having fun. And um, towards the very end, I knew with everything that I've gone through, living like a rock star, right? That's what everybody looks at. Like, oh, this is it. Being a rock star, that's like what life's about, right? Everybody wants to do that. And the year that we flew around in the jet and stuff is like, man, you you pretty much live like a rock star going to LA and hang out with those guys and the parties in Huntington Beach and it actually left me more empty, more like more in a hole and not content, no joy. You just, it made you hungrier for it. Mm. It's like, it, it was crazy. So towards the very end, like riding for Fro and <clears throat> I knew this was my last chance and I, I was, I was a pretty low point and I was like, man, what am I going to do? And, and I feel like during that time, that God was really trying to like get my attention and say, Hey man, you got to like really think about what you're doing that this is just my opinion. Right. So that's how I felt. And, but I wasn't ready. I was like, no, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I was a punk. Like I was just still going to try to raise, still going to party when I wanted to party, still do everything that I wanted to do. So, so the point where, what, what, what was your question? Well, just like, did you, you know, no, most people get to over. a point when they're like, I'm done yeah, with racing. Yeah. This is it. So, yeah. So that's background, right? So the previous like two or three years, I felt like, yeah, God's trying to get a hold of me. I'm trying to, and I was struggling really bad partying. That's not what I needed to do. You know, you know, stretching myself. Like, do I be an athlete? Do I party? Do I still do all this? And, um, so the last year, I think I was really trying to like focus on racing. I was trying to cut everything out, trying to race and do my best. And um, I just kept getting hurt, kept getting hurt. I would like blow apart my shoulder, have surgery, uh, off for three months, race once or twice, same shoulder, blow that apart, jack my knee up. And I remember I was in Mammoth and I was trying to race the four stroke nationals. I was going to get on a team to do all the four stroke nationals. That's when they were big. And I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. So I was in Mammoth and it was pro day. And the very first lap of practice, I was coming into the tree corner and it was smooth as glass. They just graded it the night before. But in one of the braking bumps, there was a big rock that they covered over so nobody could see it. And as soon as I chopped the throttle to set up for the corner, you know how you like body transfer, you know, wait forward to get on the front. And I just went straight over the bars and uh, knocked myself out and blew apart my shoulder. And as soon as I opened my eyes, I was like, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And I knew I was done. It was that, it was that quick of a decision. Wow. Was me. that 2000 or 2001? Mm, Where would that have been? 2001, maybe. Okay. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? And I knew without a doubt I was done. Mm. So I actually, I lo- I knew that my life would be totally different, 180 degree difference from what I've ever known. I knew it was. Um, somebody helped me throw my bike in the truck, went to the emergency room. They checked me out. Oh, just broke your collarbone. For the fourth time on this yeah. side. If you've never seen Phil's mm-hmm. collarbones, they look like the yeah. peaks of the Himalayas. There's just yeah, three on this <laughs> side, four on this side. And your brother too. Yeah. So went to the emergency room just to in case there was like something really wrong, right? Um, and there was, and I just broke it in half. So it's like clicking. Mm-hmm. And they gave me a prescription for Vicodin. And I was like, nope, don't need it. And then they're like, well, doesn't it hurt? I said, yeah, it hurts, but I don't need it. And I drove home Mm. from Mammoth, drove home. And I knew that my life was totally different from then on. I was done. Wow. 
Yeah, I was done. So, so <clears throat> through the last couple of years, a, a friend of mine, Doctor Toy, Kenny Toy, he was trying to like witness to me and talk to me about God and going to church, and I was really wanted no part of it. I was a punk, right? I was doing what I wanted to do, and he talks about that even now when mm. I play golf and man, you were a punk. He says, and uh, on the way home, I said, hey, dude, you going to go to church tomorrow? I'll go. And uh, he actually had a golf tournament or a golf outing he had planned. But he told me, oh, yeah, I'm going. Yeah. So he canceled so it? So he canceled it, picked me up at home, took me, and it was Sunridge. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was when they were at a middle school. Mm-hmm. Walked me to the very front. And for me, I was like, I don't care. Like, what people think of me, I'm not here for them. When he walked to the front, I'm like, I don't care about these people. Yeah. I mean, I, and my whole life has been completely different ever since that day. That's crazy. I didn't know Ken was that guy. It, yep. Ken, Ken Toy, Dr. Toy has been around the sport since the early 90s. He used to work with, on Jeremy. He's a chiropractor and a, a sports yep. doctor. Mm-hmm. He's um, worked on a lot of people. Still today, Shimoda in here, but I mean, he works on Ricky Fowler. Everyone around here. He's an <laughs> yep. awesome guy. Yep, awesome guy. And I didn't know. I didn't know that story about Mammoth. <laughs> I talked to you into going back. I think this is probably the last time you raced. That was the last time I raced. Yeah. You and I went what maybe yep. four, five, six <laughs> oh, years ago. Dude. Yep. And uh, it was a vet weekend. And uh, so, how many months did it take us to get ready for that race? The vet race. Three for me, right? Probably. Training and getting bikes ready and, you know. And first moto? Was it the first moto, too, of the weekend? I can't remember. First moto, second lap. We're, we're coming around, and I'm second or third. I'm up there. You're right behind me. And it was right before the tree turn. Yep. That little section of track's yep. really been tough on you. Yeah. And you caught a bump funny and swapped and knocked yourself out, and that was the last time you... Sh- yeah. I jacked myself up then, too. That was a pretty bad concussion, huh? Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Dang. No, yeah. more, no more mammoth for you. No for more sure. mammoth. I'm done. Okay, so what was next for you? I, you started a lawn company, right? Yeah, was that so, raised? So what was next? So, you know, like I told you, when I woke up and I said, okay, God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I'm done. Because I had no direction. I had nothing. Nothing, I, no, my, no potential. Like, well, maybe I'll do this. I dropped out of high school to race dirt bikes, Right. I didn't have any parents that were like guiding me. I, I had nothing. And, you know, through the last three or four party years, probably three party years, spent a lot of money. Mm. And, you know, I had a little bit. I had a house in Red Hawk in Temecula. Mm. I had a little bit of money. Can I sidebar something real fast? I don't want to interrupt you, but you always were the guy who had the coolest cars. Mm. Remember your. Well, black- I don't know about the coolest cars, but. Well, you had that black <laughs> truck. Uh, it was a dually Chevy, long bed, extended yeah. cab. This thing was like 25 feet long, and you slammed it to the ground on airbags. It was black, blacked out windows, Alcoa wheels. So dumb. It was cool. It was awesome. You came rolling in. I was like, damn, but, look but, at this thing. But I'm racing dirt bikes, <laughs> and I have a truck that can't go over a speed bump. And that's what I drove to the track every day. You always had the coolest stuff. And you I had, paid cash for that thing. You had big metal chains. <laughs> You remember? You'd always had like a Dude. big chain, uh, uh, watches, and then at one point... Dude, you got- I am so not like that anymore. <laughs> I drive a little like t- GMC Canyon. I know. I it- no watch. I don't want to be seen anymore. I like try to hide. Yeah. But you were dating a girl oh, named dear. Chantel. That was awful. Who I believe was a dancer. Exotic, perhaps. Yep. And you were driving a Cadillac. Mm-hmm. It was like a SRS or something. Cadillac DeVille. DeVille. It was a DeVille, which is kind of yep. like an old man's car. But you had these you should, s- you, you need spoke to wheels that. on it, and it was yep. lowered. And I was like, man, Good this party, guy. Party, party. You're a pimp, basically. Yeah, party. It's all about partying. <sighs> anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you bringing all that. <laughs> well, it's just, it's it's awesome to see your transition, but like, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Like I said, I would just stand back and watch you. Go, wow. So my family, look at him go. A- April knew my wife. April, 
man, God knew what he was doing when he put us yeah. together. She well, and like this is so why incredible. I want you to understand why I was hesitant at first. You about, know, about what? Putting you with her, right? Because I knew, oh, absolutely. I knew the yeah. backstory. Dude, I know. Okay. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I would. I am not the same person, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but my wife, she, when, when I first met April and she started asking me questions, I knew that I need to tell her everything now. Yeah. Why there's not that big of a connection. Because if she hears later and I really, really am into her and she leaves, I'll be bummed. So right now, if she leaves, it's like, I'm not that bummed because I don't have that connection. So I told her everything. I said, hey, if you ever want to know anything, yeah, I probably did it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've done it all. Well, I think I'll <laughs> <laughs> And I'm probably not the best guy ever. I did a lot of stuff. Been a lot of places yeah. and done a lot. <laughs> so, But that could have been a problem later on in your marriage had you not it, approached it right. that way. And that's why yeah. I did that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I did that. So, yeah. And God bless stuff. her for hanging in there because it, yeah, I yeah, don't know if I she mean, asked you specifics I mean, or whatever, but I don't you think told she, her. You'd yeah, be like, yep, I that, yep. I, yeah, that. I don't think she really... She knew. She's a smart girl. Yeah. Well, She's she really remember smart. her and Amber both remember because they worked at Chili's together. That's where I met Amber. And we would go in there. Huh? And they, they, both of them remembered you and Mike Craig coming in. Craig would always no, like hit not on really Mike Craig. <laughs> he didn't go in there that much, did he? Yeah, he did a lot. He did a lot. Um, but anyway, they would see you come yeah. in with girls and yeah. you know, on the big black truck and the whole deals. Anyway. All right. Like so how did the, how did the lawn company things? So oh yeah. Get to that. So, okay. So huh. it's Ray Crane, his company, yeah. right? So I was living in Red Hawk. I was done racing. It was I, Rhino's old house. Yep. You bought. Yeah. I knew that I was done. So, and then I healed up, right? Took me a couple months to heal up. And then I'm sitting in this house just going like, what am I going to do? I don't have anything. I got a little bit of money, but not a lot. And I blew through that pretty quick. And then this is when I became a Christian. For me, my biggest thing was not to worry about anything. I knew that my life would be totally different, but I didn't know what that was going to look like because I didn't know really any Christian guys or yeah. any examples, but I knew that God was going to take care of me. I knew that. But so, I was I would I needed to be willing to do whatever he asked me to do. Yeah. Was that a scary point or, or did you no, have peace in that? I was stoked. Yeah. I was like happier than I've been in probably ever. Hmm. It was crazy. I was pumped. I was, I was super stoked. And I was still partying a little bit. So it's not like I said, I'm done. That took me a long time to get away from it because it still had its hooks in me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like, oh, this miracle, I'm done. I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. It was a process. It was a process, yeah. yeah. And I didn't feel the same when I would do it either. Like oh, I would really? go to these parties and do the stuff that I did before. And I was like, I was super convicted now. I was like, what am I doing? I can't do this stuff. I don't need to do this. And this is not what I need to be doing. Mm. It was it was totally different. Mm. So, so with that being said, it's like I was willing to do whatever it took to or whatever God had for me, right? So, and a guy across the street that lived across the street, he knew, I would talk to him a little bit and he knew I just became a Christian and he was, he was a solid guy and he said, hey, um, you should start mowing lawns for people. Start a landscaping company. And I was like, all right, I'll do that. So I bought- Didn't he have, he had everything, right? Like all the equipment and stuff? Well, no, so he, this guy's like business. He knows business. So he built a big business landscaping company, sold it to True Green. And so he was like right in the middle of like starting another business. Um, but he hadn't built it yet. He wasn't started. So he already sold his and he was just telling me how to do it. So I bought Emig's, Jeff Emig's lawnmower and that he had. So I bought it for like a hundred bucks or something from Emig. And I just started mowing lawns. And, mm. and, and I can tell you, my only friend out of all the people who I thought they were friends 
was Buddy Antonez called me and said, hey, you can mow my lawn. I'll pay you to do my lawn. Fired his lawn guy and hired me. That's the only friend that did that. Wow. Out of all the people that I thought were my friends, Buddy Antonez actually took the initiative and said, I'm going to fire my guy. Called me and said, hey, I'll, I'll hire you. I'll help you. Hmm. It was like 40 bucks a month or something like that. That's but, really cool. but, but it wasn't that. It wasn't the 40 bucks. And I knew that it wasn't the money that I was having to make. I, I think it was a time in my life where I needed to show God that I was going to do whatever it took. Yeah. I was probably making 800 bucks, 1,000 bucks a month. A, a month? month? A month. Yeah. When I first started. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. building a business takes a long time. Uh, you don't got to tell it's me. It's brutal. Um, yeah. mm. was it hard to, to, you know, go from being the rock star to your mowing lawns? Um, like it was very, for your, for your pride. Was yeah, that it was extremely humbling, but I think that's one of the things that I had to do. Right. Yeah. So I think that like, <clears throat> it was extremely difficult. It was extremely humbling because I knew that, you know, I told God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And I think that during that time, it's like, Buddy Antonius, I was mowing his lawn, right? And we used to go on road rides. Like every Thursday, a group of guys would meet at his house to go on road rides. But instead of going to his house, unloading my road bike and going on a road ride, I'd be going to his house, unloading a lawnmower, right? Mm. And mowing his yard. That, that was tough. Yeah, it was extremely tough. And he would have friends over, other riders and stuff, and I'd be out mowing the lawn. Mm -hmm. And I did that for Dave or Nathan Ramsey. Yep. And I mowed his lawn for a while. Hmm. And Monica used to be my girlfriend, Nathan Ramsey's wife, right? Yeah. How bizarre is that? And I'm mowing their lawn for a couple hundred bucks a month. Wow. Yeah. I but think... but I was willing to do. I I was like, you know what? This sucks. This is the hardest thing in the world for me to do, but I'm going to do it. Mm. I'm not going to let my pride get in the way of not doing this. And I believe, well, you know, I say I believe it, but I, I think that I'm proof that God blessed me for doing that. Yeah. Because how, how what I got going on now, it's like I would never be able to pick it for me it's just like so good mm -hmm. i feel like i've won the lottery yeah you know 10 times over i truly feel like i live that life now it's hard it's not easy there's a lot of difficulty in it but it's hard yeah. it's hard to humble yourself um even going through the fire service for me trying to get into that at such i was 38 yeah i'd been a professional athlete i managed a race team i've got kids i'm married and i'm coming in as a just a piece of crap entry level fireman being a rock star kind of right? and they're screaming at you people are asking for your autographs going from that to like being a low guy yeah lowest man on the totem yeah. it's tough a lot of a lot of people can have a hard time doing that their pride will keep them from doing that yep. and that will keep them from yep. getting where they're trying to go yep so i get that willing, side willing it, to man. be broke down so you could be lifted up right yeah, yeah. So tell me how you got back into, so you're, you're building the lawn business. You did a pretty good job building that. I did. Okay. I mean, it, it wasn't that. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was starting to chip away, starting to build it. But then you got back into arena cross bud man again, yeah, right? bud man. So right. Bud man, dude, that guy's awesome. He wants to help people. He definitely helped me. So I was going to his house, mowing his lawn and I haven't ridden in a year. Like I was over it. Did you miss it at all? Nope. Didn't miss it at all. So, and then he had this a friend of his, Brad Hagseth, living with him. And, or no, staying with him. And Budman said, hey, uh, Brad needs a place to stay. I had a house. Can, do you have a room for him to rent? Because they were racing arena cross. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, he could stay with me, no problem. Um, so Brad Hagseth moved in with me for a little bit and he had these trick Suzuki's on the arena cross team. And I think one of the riders got injured and Billy Whitley was the team manager and Budman 
talked to Billy and said, hey, let Phil come do some races for you. And then they asked me, hey, do you want to step in and do do some of the races? I'm like, okay, sure, I will. And I haven't even ridden in like a year. <laughs> and I rode like twice and then went and raced. And did well, right? You won some main events. Yeah, I and... won some main events. And uh, I think that weekend I had one fastest like qualifying or whatever and got third in the main. And back then it was a still 125 and 250. Yep. Yeah. And I rode both. Yeah. It was awesome. That was yeah. such a great time. Yeah. It was a really good time. That did you, mm. I, I always wondered if um, going back to that, you kind of found, mm. did it make racing and riding fun again? Because sometimes Supergrass gets to be such a grind. And then when your results are bad, it's not fun at all. Yeah. But you go back to this and Arena Cross is definitely a more tight knit vibe. And yeah, it is. But remember, I was. I was 100% away from racing for a year. I didn't even go to races. I didn't look at it. I didn't do anything. I just like mowed lawns and did what I needed to do. Um, so when I did came back, it was pretty fresh and exciting. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Oh, I could ride pretty good still. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Coming from a lawnmower, you know, a landscaper. And like, man, I could get on the podium. This is pretty cool. And that was exciting. Yeah. And my mindset was different too. I was a lot humbler, if that's a word. More humbler. Humble, but all right. More gotcha. humble, humbler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was a whole different thing. I I, I was uh, pumped to be there instead of miserable and punk yeah. and cocky. And it was just a fun and, time. And you're with Budman and Whitley. Those are yep. great guys, right? Yeah. That was super fun. You did that for what, like two seasons? Yep. And you make it probably made, what were they paying you? Like per I race? did okay. Yeah. So one of the yeah. So when I did that, I sold the landscape, the accounts that I had built. I so I just sold that. I just said, hey, I'm not going to do this landscaping anymore. I'm going to race arena cross. So that's how I was making my money to pay. To oh, okay. Pay my bills. I thought you were doing both. So you got well for a little bit. I did. Okay. So yeah. So 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 at the very beginning, I was landscaping and racing. And I didn't even ride during the week. I would just go to the races on the weekend and race because I was working during the week. Yeah. And um, so I think the first year I was doing landscaping and then it was the second year where I knew I was going to come back and race that I'm like, I'm not even going to landscape. I'm just going to sell it to a friend of mine, the accounts that I got. So then I was just racing only and I started riding during the week and results went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> how's that happen no they didn't go downhill but um i still want a couple here and there okay um but then that same guy that had me uh start landscaping he was starting a parking lot sweeping business because he builds maintenance businesses and get builds them to a certain level and sells them yeah and uh he was starting parking lots and it was all nighttime work and he said, hey, do you want to try this? And I said, sure. So I drove for him for 12 bucks an hour. Mm. Yeah. And I did that for a, while, a long time. Yeah. And, and that I, was towards the end of Arena Cross. Okay. When I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> I remember a conversation we had because mm. you were driving all night long out on this sweeper, cleaning lots. Yep. Mm. And then sleeping most of the day, you get up, have dinner, hang out for a little bit, and then back to, back in the yeah. thing. I'm like, dude, this is no life. You gotta. Yeah. When we would have family stuff going on, huh? Yeah, I'm like, Phil, you gotta like get it to where you're just running the business. And yeah. man, if you didn't do that, like you. Yeah, so that that's out. a little bit down the road. So at the end of my last year race in Arena Cross, um, I knew that. I mean, I was old. Arena Cross wasn't going to be a career for me. I knew that I still needed to do something. So that's when my friend Ray across the street said, you could drive for me for 12 bucks an hour. And I knew that the dirt bike industry is not in my future. I mm. knew that. Yeah. So I was willing to do whatever it took. So I said, yeah, I'll drive for you. And I drove for him for 12 bucks an hour for maybe a year. And working at night was tough. Mm. <laughs> and, then, um, and then he said, hey, start your own business. I'll help you start your own. There's enough work for all of us. And then I took That's a, pretty cool. Yeah, super cool. 
he's a Christian guy. He was like, he was wanting to help. He knew where I was at and he knew where my heart was and that I was willing to work. And then, um, I said, okay. So I took a second mortgage out of my house to buy my first truck. Yep. Scary, right? Well, for me, it wasn't that scary because it was just me. I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. Yeah. And I'm like, what are they going to do? Take me to jail? I'll just give the truck back if it doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> you know, so what? Well, it was just, I got to try something. So I did. I bought my own truck and um, he subcontracted a lot of work to me at the beginning to pay my bills. I did the work and as I got my own, you know, work, I gave his back. Mm. So, man, that was over 20 years ago. Yeah, time yeah, flying. Long time. <clears throat> I just remember thinking early on, like, man, he's he, this isn't sustainable. He can't keep working all night. Yeah, he's a zombie. Tough. And then... Um, I think it was eight years I worked at night before I was able to hire somebody part-time. <sighs> Seven or eight years, yep. And then finally I got enough work. I'm like, okay, I can hire somebody part-time. Um, yeah, that's brutal. So, you know, talk about that growth from, from that, those beginnings to where you're at now. And I, I tell people all the time on this show, because there's pretty much everybody, when they quit racing professionally, struggles to transition to whatever's next. It's hard. It's hard. And to be successful at anything is hard. Yes. Because, because I think success or however you want to define it means it means different for everybody, but to be successful and successful in business or an athlete, there's a million people out there that want to do it. Right. Who's willing to put in the work mm -hmm. to actually do it? Yeah. Not many. No, you're right. Not many. Not many. But I, I tell guys this. If you were any good at motocross, you learned everything you need to know to yeah. go be successful. It's hard work. It's hard. I mean, it's mostly hard work, right? Yep. Mostly hard work. Dedication. Yeah. Commitment. And I, I feel like you mm -hmm. are like the perfect example of that. You you know, um, who's the guy? The I'm brain farting on his name, but he says, you know, give me Harvard educated kids versus motocross guys. I'll take the motocross guys every day. Because, the successful motocross guys. Right. Yeah. Because he just said that, that, that those traits are way more important than sitting in a classroom. Yeah. And um, like I said, I think you're the perfect example of that. Dropped out of high school. Amazing racer. But when that came to an end, you were you were rock bottom. Yeah. And now you've got, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, tell me where your business is at, but it's killing it. Like you yeah, guys have done great we're, things. We're doing well. Yeah. We're doing well now. Um I'm so thankful for it. Like I said, I feel like I won the lottery, you know, but when the lottery's instant, this didn't happen instant, <laughs> right? No. Happened over 20 years. It took mm -hmm. me 20 years to build the business where it is. We're doing really well. I'm very thankful for it, but it was ex a lot of extremely hard work. Eight, eight years yep, of being up all eight, night. All night, yep. And I remember I just... Uh, added another scope of work. So I was doing that on the weekends. Yeah, it, it, it was tough. <clears throat> Man, what what advice would you give for people who may be in that spot? Like their racing didn't work out or they're done and they're like... So, so my... So what I would say is I would ask somebody, do you want to do this? And if they said, yeah, yeah, I want to do it, then they can do it. But nine out of 10 times, they don't want it bad enough. Hmm. If you want something bad enough, if you're physically able to do it, you, why, then you can do it. It's just, it comes down to desire and dedication and not giving up. Yeah, I wanted to give up. I wanted to give up a lot. It was so gnarly. So hard. I would be with you, right? At fam Christmas or whenever, or like parties or whatever. Oh, I got to go to work in three hours. You remember, right? Dude, I totally do. I just remember thinking, I, I don't know how he does it. Yeah, and I have to be up all night. It's going to be a nine-hour night of like hard work. And I got to go in three hours. I got to go home and sleep one hour. 
I know we'd always be like, oh, Phil, you got to go already. Come on. Yeah. You're like, bro, yeah, I'm yeah. going to work in, yeah. in four hours. I got to go get a three-hour nap. It was hard. It wasn't easy. Mm. So m- more than 95% of people wouldn't have done that, right? So when, so when you see people, I hear people, oh, man, I wish I had what you had, you, what you have. You know, they see my house and all the sweepers and everything. I wish I had what you have. Oh, really? You do? <laughs> How bad? Do you think, because I would say that that applies in racing too, right? Anything. You, sure. You, how, it's not how bad you want it. It's are you willing to do the work right. to get it? Right. And sacrifice the things you got to sacrifice. But it comes to desire first, right? Totally. You have to want it so bad you're willing to do whatever it takes to get there. Yeah. And that I was willing to do whatever it took. I didn't stop. Mm. Trust me, I wanted to. Yeah, I actually did one night or one morning. I came home. I was married. I came home and I said, April, I can't do it anymore. Oh, really? Because it was such a tough night. Yeah. I said, I can't do it anymore. And she looks at me. She's like, what? And I said, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. Because it was such a difficult night. She said, just go to bed. And I woke up and I was like, okay, I'll go tonight. Let's see how tonight goes. Day at a time. Dude, it was tough. And you had, I remember stories too where, um, you know, you're up all night blowing out parking lot corners and then sweeping yep. it up with this thing. And you had some people jump out with knives. You've had like some eh, issues. Nothing too bad. Well, there was one up nothing in like off bad. Clinton Keith, right? Didn't some guy jump out of a, behind a dumpster and. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, yeah. There's been interesting nights for sure. Nothing I was afraid of. Okay. You know, uh, people jumping out of trash. Or maybe it was one of your guys you had driving for you. And yeah. Seeing guys beat up girls that you like jump out. And I don't know. I've always felt good. Like no problem. Yeah. Clear headed. You, you know what I'm saying? There's yeah. a lot you can do. Well, and in, 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 you know, being done with racing, it's like, I don't need to be like back then when I first started, I was just into lifting. I got into lifting and I was pretty strong back then and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just my program. That's what I was you doing. You had some muscles for a while. I did for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can tell you as your as your brother and your friend, like it's been it's been cool to watch your progression, you know. Like from when I first met you, you know, kind of you sure, you were to yeah. me were way up here like on the peak of being one of the best ever to then kind of see you go through this party phase and then get into this you know, get married to, you know, my sister in law. Yeah. Then watch you build this business and then just to become the guy you are, man, it's it's cool. Yeah, what a story, huh? It is. And yeah, it's well, uh, I, well, I appreciate it, Ping. It's like what a blessing to have a family like I do. Right? Yeah. And uh that was something too. You and I had conversations early on. I just said, Man, like this family's amazing. Like you it's it's pretty good. It really <laughs> is. It's like, right? You can, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, Father-in-law, or, mother-in-law, uh, sisters, you know, we, it's incredible. And, you know, yeah. our, our sisters have another sister, a uh, younger sister, and she her husband's somebody. awesome. Yeah, she's actually doing your books now. Yep. Um, the, the, our father-in-law is an old fireman, so he got my career started. He goes mountain biking with us. He surfs with us. It's like, I don't think there's a lot of guys. What, what who, an example he has been. Yeah. Like, so the very first time April brought me to their house to introduce me, it's like, you know, I'm naive, I'm dumb and like, don't know, but you have informed them like my past, (laughs) right? So like, I guess you told them stories about who I was and what I was doing, my party days, right? Dude, out of and and like I want not you to know, I, I was making sure I was just protecting. I was trying right, to protect dude, April. Absolutely, right? yeah. absolutely. I wasn't talking bad. But check but. this out. I go to the house and meet them, and they have never treated me like nothing but respect and kind. Yeah. Even knowing, like what I used to do, and like incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, man, what a great example. It's a. Uh, you know, I think for both of us too, like we, we talked about earlier, we come from broken homes and your mom passed away early, but to have, I think for both of us, it was important to get married to someone who had that strong 
family unit. For right? me, that was everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was done. I was done with the party girls. And yeah. I knew where that would lead. So roll that into now. You've got two boys. What are they, 14 and... 13 and 11. Taller than me. Both of them already. Yeah. Little jerks. Um, <laughs> how is it raising two boys? And they've not really... You never got them into riding. We, we took them out a couple of days. Yeah, a little bit. They're just not... So I think they're going to be too tall. I, <laughs> I really think that I was too tall. Yeah. It, it like did not work in my favor you think to so? be six three mm. yeah ruts you know big long leg size 13 shoe that's not the best thing for a dirt bike you're probably right yeah so but i wasn't interested dirt bikes were like they are dangerous you're yeah. gonna fall yeah and you're gonna get hurt so, they, so grayson likes <clears throat> you know he's a basketball kid um Yep. But like, just talk about kind of raising your boys and what you're doing with them. Cause... Man, so that's, you know, one of the things that like, that's the hardest job I think almost I've ever had because it's more mental. It's like, man, if you, I want to, I'm doing my very best to raise boys that have integrity, a solid foundation, good Christian young men, you know, that's their own journey, right? Mm -hmm. That's not something that I could make them be. I'm a Christian because what God has done in my life. So that's just going to be something that they're going to have to decide. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but I do want them to be good young men and grow up to be solid. And I think that's extremely difficult as well. It's a hard job, right? Hard job. I mean, I've got yeah. two girls. So our, I think it's a little bit different. Our views, like how we, how you raise girls versus how you raise boys. It's slightly sure. Different. Yeah. Absolutely. But a lot of the same foundational stuff. A lot. A lot yeah. Um, it's hard. It's hard. There's um, a lot of opposition out there. Jeez. But and then you have your young boys that like, shh, dude, they like girls, right? Which is great. That's yeah. they're built for that. Yeah, you should. Yeah. But he, don't look at them like this. Try and, yeah, and you're look looking at them at, like this, right? And you're looking at it through a lens of what you've done, right? Right. So every boy that comes into my house, I and mean, of course Ellie loves racing, so she's following a bunch of racing boys. I'm like, oh no. Oh. And I, I'm just, they walk in and I go, I know just what you're to, thinking. Just look at the car they drive. If it's a Cadillac, don't, <laughs> don't let them. <laughs> you're out, beat it. Yeah. yeah. No, nope, you're done. Well, I, I just saw this the other day. Mm. Um, Jordan Peterson has this quote and he said um, something, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But That's something, who I heard when he was talking about soft men. Yeah. Jordan Peterson. Well, he said, you, you don't really become an adult <laughs> until you have children. Because until you have something uh, that you value more than your own life, it's hard to make that transition. Mm -hmm. And so something you'd either die for or, or a reason, something you'd live for, right? Like it, it's really the complete opposite end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. spectrum from narcissism. And like, I found that to be true. Like when you have mm -hmm. kids, it's like, okay, it's time to be an Dude, adult. It's n so when you have kids, if, in my opinion, if you want to raise them how you should raise them, this is my opinion, right? It's not about you anymore. Right. It has nothing to do with you. You, you know what I'm You've saying? You've got to it's completely like, put yourself now right. third or fourth. Yeah, or yeah. You know, you're, you're like, it's about your family now. Yeah. It's not like, do you want to go golf? Sure, there's a time and place, absolutely. But if your kid mm. has something going on, it's yeah. not about your pleasure anymore, dude. You've had that already. And you know... I, I think as a racer, you've got to be selfish. You have to. You just, yep. you have to be. And I, and I, I find it, um, I think it's probably very, I wasn't married for very long when I was racing, but it's got to be tough. And then for a wife to just go, okay, you're first. It's all about you, right? Mm -hmm. But once you quit racing, you have to learn how to not be selfish in a marriage, right? Now it's, now it's a process. Now it's a partnership. Yep. Okay. And then when you have kids, it's not even a partnership Dude, anymore. Yeah, yeah. You're back to like mm. way back in line. And and it took me some time, I don't know about you, but to like, it always takes, I, I'm like a slow transition. I don't think right? you ever arrive. You know what I'm saying? I don't think no. you ever like, okay, I'm where I should be. It's no, like, no. I think you're always growing. Yes. Agreed. You should be. Agreed. You slip back into dumb ways, right? Yeah. And then it's like, okay. 
But I look back, mm. and, and, and this is, should be the goal, I guess, right? You look back every five years or so, and you go, oh man, I was, I was selfish, right? You know, you can see the improvement you've made as a person, right? And kids force that or kind of charge that where it's like, okay, if you're a decent human being at all, you're putting your kids in front of you and trying to figure out like, okay, I'll have, it's about me and those little windows when it can be about me, but most of the time it's about them. I think kids is a great learning tool yeah. because it shows you how selfish you are and how like, yeah, it's like Grayson will do stuff or Grant. I'm like, man, that's so me. Yeah. That's weird too, right? <laughs> right? Seeing yourself yeah. in them. It's like, yeah. Um, is there anything, um, do you miss the sport at all? Like do you miss riding at all? Not really. No, I don't really miss it. I, I mountain bike quite a bit yeah. as much as I can. I'm busy. Work is busy, but I, honestly, most of my time is invested into the family and my, into my boys. Yeah. And work, you know, besides the work. Well, I wonder if I didn't have a job in this industry, if I would, would I go buy my own bike and would I still ride? I won't. Well, you know. I don't go buy my own bike because I know you have it. <laughs> and, and that's true. It's like anytime I want to go ride, I can, hey, ping. And you know you always have a bike here to ride. Absolutely. And you but have you great still, bikes. You still don't really take me up on a very When's the last time I did? Oh, months ago? It's been months. It's been months. Sure. And before that, maybe year? years. Yeah, it's been Two, a long yeah. time. You go long stretches without I'm, riding. I'm not really interested a whole bunch. Hmm. I mean, I will. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of racing. It just, I'm always surprised to say big because I only watch the highlights. You don't watch the whole thing. No. Ah, well, well I went to a, a two. That was cool. But it like Johnny O, um, you know, Johnny O is awesome. Yeah. I saw him at a two. He stopped what he was doing, came over to me and was like, so sincere. Even my wife, April, when we walked away, that guy was really nice. He's the best. Yeah. Johnny's yeah. great. And it's like, dude, why would he be nice to me? You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. He's like a stud. I'm just like a nobody. Well, he's he's another guy who like doesn't ride anymore. He's And he's around it a lot. But mm -hmm. I always thought it's weird that because you could get on a bike right now and go fast mm -hmm. still. You don't forget how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like for me, I can just cruise around at 80%. And I'm just, it's just so fun to me. Yeah. yeah. And it's like therapy for my but brain. It, it's fun to me. It's totally fun to me. But for me, it's like. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of Dude, work. Dude, last time I came to borrow bikes from you, it took me a week to like <laughs> get them all <laughs> back together how I borrowed them. Yeah, it's true. And like it is a lot. $500 worth of parts. <laughs> well, that was Grayson crashing and his buddy. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's like, oh my gosh. Do you ever see yourself doing anything in the sport again? Is there anything you'd want to do? No. <clears throat> no, I'm content yeah. doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Running a business is tough. Yeah. Staying on top of it. I mean, I have a manager that takes care of a lot of stuff and secretary. My wife does a lot of stuff and guys that do their job and it's still tough. Yeah. I mean, it's a good business because I have a lot of free time. Yep. In that free time, I, I kind of look at it like, what am I doing with my free time? Am I using it just for myself? Or am I investing in other people and helping other people and raising these boys how they should and making sure that I'm doing with my time what I should be doing? Yeah. Because I believe that God has blessed me so much, given me so much that I need to be faithful with that now. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So that's how I feel. So, I mean, I still go golf and I'll go ride mountain bikes and surf and play basketball. Yeah. It's great. The fun thing I've I've tried my best to do is find stuff I can do with my kids. Yep. Snow skiing. Like yep. My girls and I love to snow ski. Yeah. And um, damn, it's so damn expensive. It's hard to do it a lot. But man, when you can combine something you love with something your kids you get them to love it too, and now you're hanging out doing something with them that you both love. Yeah. That's the sweet spot. Yep. Yeah. Well, wakeboarding. Yeah. Grayson Grant is not really super like pumped on skiing or wakeboarding, but Grayson loves it. Yeah. Wake surfing. Yeah. That's cool. He loves basketball. Yeah. That's what he's doing. That's easy. You guys can go shoot, yep. you know, just shoot some hoops. And I'll do that with him. I spend a lot of time. Actually, I had a conversation with April this morning about 
<clears throat> how much time I spend with Grace. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's great, right? But everything comes at a cost. I'm spending this much time with Grace and what about Grant now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So like I need to take some of that time away from Grace and, and, and give it to Grant. Yeah. You know, it can't be lopsided. It's a balance. Um, well, the last question we kind of ask all our guests is how you want to be remembered in the sport. <clears throat> in the sport? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't really care. <laughs> you don't really care? <laughs> no. No, it's really, I mean, I really don't. It's, you, you know, so for me and my thinking is like I put a huge black eye on myself because of my last few years of racing. So like when I just said, why is Johnny O'Mara so nice to me? Right. I look at myself like my last few years, like just a party loser. Like it's humiliating. It honestly is. I did a lot of stupid things that, dude, so dumb. Just partied. Hmm. That was what I put in front. So, but now that's not me anymore. Right. So when I go and like a lot, you know, humble and, you know, when Johnny O'Mara comes over and says, hey, dude, how you been? And like super kind. It's like catches me off guard a little bit. Man, mm. this guy's super cool to me. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but that could just be me thinking that. Well, where you're at now, you look back at your career with kind of like. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that's that, how I look. And I was an idiot, but you could look at it a couple of ways. One, you were a kid. Right. And as we talked about, not a lot of guidance. You were just doing what anyone would have done. And dude, you were fast, man. You're winning races. You're on the box with the best guys in I, the world. I, I think that I was faster than my results show. A hundred percent. Yeah. So we would go practice and that's just being young and dumb and just twisting the throttle. Right. Just like I could do it. Well, you have and to, it showed sometimes. Yeah. In yeah. my results. So yeah. people remember you for that. They remember you from the, the 90s party stuff too because you leaned into that heavy. But people, that was wild. It's a time in our sport that I don't think will ever be re replicated. How would I want to be remembered is just like, well, however they want to remember me. I don't, yeah. it just doesn't, it's not important to me. Well, what I think is neat is that you went from that party guy. You were certainly capable in the, you know, as far as a racer, but what you've done with your life afterwards. I, to me, yeah. that's always like the litmus test. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of great mm -hmm. motorcycle racers. Uh, but what kind of person are you? That That's shown, in my opinion, by what you do after you're done. Because that's a mm -hmm. making that transition to whatever's next. Whew, it's yeah. tough. You know, whether you're drinking, partying, or you're not. Even if you're a sober dude. There's a lot of guys that I won't name names, but... A lot of those real clean cut guys through the 90s that never touched a drop. Right. Struggling hard yep. to make a transition to what's next. Doesn't it, it, it doesn't matter. You, it, it's a very tough transition to make. And what you've done as a person, professionally, with your family. Well, I appreciate that. <clears throat> it means a lot coming from you. It really does. Um, I just think that like a lot of guidance, a lot of help a lot of asking questions, a lot of prayer. You know what I'm saying? Like <clears throat> when I hit, when I hit bottom, it really was like, I don't know anything. I'm, I have no guidance. I have no direction. I have nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. God help me. Really. I mean, I, it was, it was like that. Yeah. I was on my knees done. God help me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was willing to, okay, whatever you want me to do, because I don't know. And I think it was just a lot of, a lot of that and a lot of asking questions. Now I have a learner's heart, right? Now I want to know because I have to know or else I'll die. I, I don't know. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just totally different. I, but I appreciate that ping that you, you feel that way. Yeah, it's um, it's impressive. So I love you. Thanks for coming yeah. on. Love you too, man. Okay. Stay tuned. We'll be back to wrap up the show. I want to be bad with you, girl, like we're robbing a bank. I want to be mad at the world like it took you away. All right.
right, welcome back, guys. Uh, I want to thank Phil Lawrence for taking the time to come in today. Um, you know, I'm 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 lucky to have a, a, such a good uh, friend and guy that I've known for so long, and we have so many things in common as a brother-in-law. Uh, I know sometimes that's um, people don't get along with their in-laws and things like that, and that's I know I'm lucky. Uh, I'm stoked that he came in. He's got a an interesting story for sure, and um, what he's what he's done with his life post racing to me is, is as impressive or more than what he did on a dirt bike. So, um, appreciate him taking the time to come in. It's funny. We don't see each other as often as you think. I mean, we only live 10 minutes from one another, but both of us are so busy, man, it's pretty rare. We even own a little boat together that, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we rarely see each other, even though we, uh, we have so many ties. So, um, anyway, he's an awesome dude. I'm stoked to have him on. Thank you guys for tuning in. Always appreciate it. Uh, as always, please swing over to Whiskey Throttle Media and just see the things we're doing there. We've got a lot of cool content that is different than what you're going to see anywhere else. Um, we're not trying to chase the same stuff everyone else is. The only racing content we have are our Sight Lap and Riders meeting shows. And those are hosted by former professional racers or current professional racers. Um, just to give you a perspective of somebody that's actually been there and done that and what they're seeing. So everything that we do takes a different tact and... I think you'll see that and uh, some of the things we're focusing on, just more of the people, personalities and the culture of the sport uh, that I think is not being given enough attention. And there's, there's other things we've got coming up. Can't announce them just yet, but we've got some really cool stuff in the pipeline and, and really cool people we're about to bring on that uh, I think are going to be game changers for us. So as always, thank you for supporting this show. Uh, appreciate you guys sticking with us through a transitional period for us where we're in this crappy little makeshift studio. We do have a, a studio being built that is custom made for us. Uh, it's just taken some time, but it's going to be a great thing for us long-term. And so uh, anyway, thank you guys so much for supporting the show. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you guys here in a couple weeks. We've got some great shows coming up, some really, really interesting guests that are going to be uh, a lot of fun to sit down and talk with. So uh, support our sponsors if you can. Thanks so much. See you next time. The Whiskey Throttle Show is brought to you by Yamaha. Join the Blue Crew today and take advantage of all that Yamaha has to offer, including amateur racing trackside support, awesome Yamaha contingency, Jason Rain's demos and instructional classes, and frankly, the most high-performing motorcycles available in the market today. Whether you're looking for a four-stroke, a two-stroke, a side-by-side, -side, a quad, a boat, a generator, Yamaha prides themselves on absolute top-level quality and reliability. Rev your heart with Yamaha and join the Blue Crew today. Method Race Wheels, bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, or SUV. They've been dominating the Baja 500 and 1000 and every major off-road event around the world for years with high quality and performance. They also look amazing. They come in a bunch of different styles and colors for your rig, so check them out. You can get 20% off a set of wheels using our code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces. 20% off using our code. Check them out. Troy Lee Designs is the leader in off-road motocross apparel and style. So whether you're looking for a cool new paint job for your helmet, maybe your name and number on your helmet lettered on, you're looking for new gear, you're looking for mountain bike gear, off-road gear. They've got the brand new Scout line in GP and SE models. Troy Lee Designs has it all. They've been leading this industry for decades, and they're going to continue to do it. Check out TroyLeeDesigns.com. SKDA is a moto graphics and seat covers company with several offices based around the globe. For too long, bikes and graphics have all looked the same. They just start to blend together. SKDA is working to change that. With super clean and unique design work, a bike with SKDA graphics stands out in a crowd and adds a touch of art to the world of moto. Hey, we need that. SKDA prides itself on providing premium customer service both before and after the sale is made. Visit SKDA online to view the current product range and get in touch with their team to get your bike refreshed. I want to just make a, a mention here that these guys, not only is their design way outside the box, very, very cool. They'll work with you on custom things. The, the products are incredible, okay? They'll speak for themselves. But what's really awesome, and you'll notice this the minute you order one of these, man, they give you an email saying, hey, the product's been shipped. Uh, hey, the product is here. It landed in this spot. Hey, it's coming today. Hey, your product's been delivered. They, they're just so good about staying in touch with you and letting you know where it's at. Customer service is 100%, and uh, that's just something that's rare these days. Check out SKDA. Here at the Whiskey Throttle Show, we're all about supporting brands that support our sport. 
And there's one tire company that has never walked away from the sport of motocross and supercross, and it's Dunlop. When times got tough and the economy took a crash, Dunlop stepped up and stayed with our sport to support it and the athletes and individuals that love it. Their MX-53 line and MX-33 lines absolutely dominate this sport. Every national championship at the pro level has been won in the last decade, and nearly every single amateur national championship at Loretta Lynn's has been won on a Dunlop. So if you're looking for high performance, you're looking for amazing quality, and you're looking to support a brand that never turns its back on our sport, there's only one choice for you, and it's Dunlop. Pro Circuit is the leader in aftermarket performance and quality. Whether you're looking for a little more horsepower out of your engine, some quality hard parts to improve the way your bike feels and looks, better handling through suspension or linkage or linkage arms, Pro Circuit is where you need to stop. It's your one-stop shop. You can go in there and get everything you need to make your motorcycle go from average to exceptional. Pro Circuit's got enough number one plates on their wall to side an entire home, and there's a reason for that. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the highest quality products with one goal in mind, and that's winning. Check out ProCircuit.com. Nihilo Concepts is leading the way in aftermarket hard parts. With their secondary on-switch device, something that was much needed in this sport, they've been innovating and bringing new products to market. Their latest is the new Nihilo Run-Cool Brake Pistons. They're designed to be stronger than stock and provide exceptional cooling performance with less brake drag. Most OEM calipers pistons are made from aluminum that just can't hold it to the heat and extreme demands of serious racing. When they get hot, the aluminum will distort, causing loss of hydraulic pressure and brake failure. Nihilo's run-cool pistons limit the area that boiling hot hydraulic fluid is able to come in contact with the piston, leaving two-thirds of the piston volume in open air with breather holes to enhance the cooling ability. It's made of a proprietary stainless blend, which is better at dissipating heat. You have issues with brake fade or brake failure, check out Nihilo Concepts among their many amazing hard parts and carbon fiber parts and titanium. NihiloConcepts.com. Seat Concepts is the leader in motorcycle saddles. If you're looking for a new cover or a new seat entirely, Seat Concepts is the place to go. They make custom seat foams catered to your height, weight, riding ability, riding type. They also have waterproof covers and, and foams that will not break down if you ride in a lot of inclement weather. And they pride themselves on being much more comfortable than OEM or any other aftermarket company. If you're looking for a new seat or a new cover, Seat Concepts, there's nothing better. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the Polaris RZR 800s. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the... If you've got a little Grom that's looking to get started in the motorcycle world, the best way to get them going is on a Stasic bike. They've got multiple sizes, so from your very young Groms to those who are a little more grown up, you can start them safely. They've got controls that allow you to control the speed so he can't get going too quick. They can touch the ground. There's not a lot of noise to distract them. It's the perfect way to get your child involved in motorcycling at a very young age. And if you've got a kid who's already out ripping... There's series popping up all over. For those of you in Southern California, go to www.ameminicross.com and join their local series. If you're outside of this state, contact your local track and ask them about starting a Stasic class at your local track. Get over to stasic.com and check out all they've got going on. Motul USA, uh, we, we lean hard on these lubricants to keep us uh, on the track and on the trail. And Motul has proven their quality over and over, uh, most recently with their Dakar win with Ricky Brabeck. Uh, they're sponsoring Supercross teams. They're diving into our sport again full full throttle, and uh, we're stoked to have them on board. Amazing products, top to bottom. Motul USA, go check them out. 
And finally, last but not least, specialized bicycles. If you are in the market to start pedaling, this is where you want to start. Uh, they've got great entry-level bikes all the way up to the Cadillac, the new Levo um, e-bike. Uh, any, anything in between, man. It doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Go check out and start with Specialized. Don't waste your time on something that's going to break. The derailleur's not going to shift after a couple months. Get something quality. Uh, these guys make it. Specialized leads that industry. Thanks for watching and listening to the Whiskey Throttle Show. Be sure to like and subscribe to get notified when new shows go up. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And visit whiskeythrottlemedia.com for additional content.